this committee. Are, is anyone aware of any apologies? Nope, okay. Move the agenda item two then, chairperson's business. Agenda item 2.1 refers to the budget for 2020-2021 and our response from the Department of Education on that budget is at page three of table papers. Can I seek members agreement to forward the correspondence with the department's original briefing to the committee for finance? Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Okay, can I, agenda item 2.2, can I refer members to correspondence from the speaker at page eight of table papers regarding a public petition on stopping the proposed closure of Barnish Primary School, Ballyhoy, which was led in the assembly on the 1st of February by Philip McGuigan, MLA. Members content to note the correspondence, agreed? Agreed. Okay, members, uh, agenda item three then, draft minutes. Can I refer members to the draft minutes of the committee meeting of the 3rd of February at page six of your meeting packs and seek your agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings, agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank Agreed. you. Thank you, members. Uh, there are no matters arising. Any members have any matters arising? No. Okay, then we move to agenda item five, which is our ministerial briefing. Uh, can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members from the spotlight and add the witnesses? Can I refer members to a briefing note from the committee clerk at page 13? A response from the Department of Education regarding COVID-19 issues raised by the committee at page 16. Responses from the Public Health Agency and Education Authority regarding committee concerns over the publication of COVID-19 guidance for schools at page 24. Correspondence from a nursery assistant regarding the safety of non-teaching staff at page 32. Concerns relating to exams at page 33. Correspondence from the Department of Education, the Children's Law Centre and a concerned individual regarding post-primary transfer at page 36 and correspondence from the NASUWT and concerned teachers regarding the Minister's decision that from September 2022 WJEC qualifications will no longer be approved for use in Northern Ireland schools at page 46. On that note, can I welcome Peter Weir, MLA, the Minister for Education, Ricky Irwin, Director of Inclusion and Wellbeing, Karen McCulloch, Director of Curriculum Qualifications and Standards, and Janice Scallon, Director of Sustainable Schools Policy and Planning. Can I check with the department that witnesses are in place and ready to go? Chair, yeah. uh, uh, the Minister here. Um, Certainly, Ricky and myself, we're just checking because I think from, from the point of view of our officials, I think we thought this was this particular evidence session would just start at half nine. So if you just okay. give us a minute or two, because two of us are going to be checking just whether some of the other officials are here. Okay, I, I could probably uh, move on to a couple of other agenda items. Minister, okay, if, that, if that buys yeah, you a short okay. moment. Okay. Yeah, okay. Clark, maybe we uh, can discharge some other business to give the department some time to get the witnesses in place. Would that make sense? Yeah, um, we can look at the correspondence, Chair. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Clark. Okay, so members, um, if I refer you to page 194 of uh, your pack, there are 14 items of correspondence in there, um, and a summary note um, is included at pages 195 to 197. Um, are members content to dispose of the correspondence as per that summary? I'm going to note some exceptions now. Yeah, if you, if you uh, uh, bring the exceptions forward there, Clark, then we can uh, agree as the summary and the exceptions. Thanks. Sure. So item 7.2 on page 198 is a response from the Department on Emotional Health and Wellbeing. Um, have, do members have any views on that at the moment? Happy to note. Um, yeah. It's getting primacy, but I'm happy to note, yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay, we'll, we'll note that for now, and if members have any uh, follow-up in relation to that correspondence, happy to bring that to the committee next week, members, agreed? Great. Yeah. Thank you. 7.3 on page 203 is correspondence from Action for Children, um, seeking the committee's support for their bid for funding from the department for the Blues programme, 
Um, members may wish to note this as Action for Children will be briefing the committee on the Blues programme at its meeting next week. Um, so maybe just bring that forward next week, sure. Yeah, members content to note that and consider action at next week's meeting further to the briefing. Agreed? Yes, please, Chair. Thank um, you. Item 7.4 on page 208 is a uh, response from CCEA about its relationship and sexuality, or SE hub. Um, are you content to note and forward that response to the Belfast Youth Forum for information? Yeah, sure. Clark, if, we, if I could propose it, we forward it to the Belfast Youth Forum, um, who, who conducted uh, constructive work in relation, to, in, in relation to relationships and sexuality education. and and seek their response and whether they would like us to raise any further questions with the department in relation to this. Members, agreed? Great. Thank you. Sure. Um, item 7.5 on page 225 is correspondence from Pramana and Oma District Council seeking the committee's support in the introduction of a process to record instances of seclusion and restraint to ensure that accurate data is available about that. Um, members will be aware that on the 24th of February, um, they're having two evidence sessions about uh, seclusion and restraint and the link up with the UNCRC um, in respect of those rights. Um, so members, are you content to forward this time being to the department and ask what consideration it has given to this proposal? Yeah, members, if I could just add to that as well, it's my understanding that the Department of Education has established a, a working group uh, to update guidance in relation to seclusion and restraint. So if we could forward this correspondence and seeking an update in relation to that matter um, and advise Fermanagh and Oma District Council that we have taken that action um, and that we are taking evidence on this matter in coming weeks and if you're content also we could advise them that it's my intention to bring uh, a draft motion on this matter to the committee for its consideration the members be content with that response absolutely chair yep agreed okay thank you okay item seven seven on page two three eight is a response from the department regarding the rights of the child and um, indicating that the minister plans to meet with the children's law center to hear the concerns they raise in the report and the priorities which came to the fore during the stakeholder event uh, are members content to note and forward to the uh, children's law center for information agreed yeah. Content. Agreed. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's constructive to hear that the minister or the department are meeting with Children's Law Centre. I think they've made some really constructive evidence-based, rights-based contributions um, throughout the pandemic, so that, that's encouraging members. Thanks, Clark. Okay, um, item 78 on 242 is a response from the Education Authority providing figures relating to the number of referrals to the statutory assessment panel, completed send statutory statements and open cases. The authority indicates that a comprehensive review of the education psychology service is being planned um, as part of the SEND strategic development programme. Um, so do members have views on, on handling this? Clark, can I check when the education authority is next at the committee to provide us with an update on the, the numerous reviews into its operations that are underway. Um, um, let me check that one and come back to you. Perhaps in forward work plan. Is that okay? That that's fine. But they we are, they are scheduled to come to the committee in the forward work program. That's right, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Okay. So are, are are members content to note that correspondence and consider questions coming from it for when the education authority are next at the committee? Yeah, yeah, please. It's something that we talked about actually with regard to not just the two different but what they want at the moment, because we know we can do that. I think that's a, that's a good point to make. Okay. Um, item 7 9 on page 250 is correspondence from the Committee for Health um, seeking information on what engagement the committee has had with the department in regard to research on post primary school experiences of 16 to 21 year olds who are um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transsexual which were published by the department in September 2017. Um, are members content to write to the department seeking information on the actions they have taken to support LGBT people um, following the publication of this report? Yeah, great members, yeah. 
Yep. yep. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, item 710 on page 251 is correspondence um, from the Committee for Health again asking that the committee bring to the attention of the Education Authority concerns regarding conversion therapy and a related social media post by a member of the board of the authority. Um, are members content to bring that to the attention of the authority? Content. Yeah, yeah content. agreed. Okay, thank you. Um, 711 on page 253 is correspondence from an individual seeking the committee's support to investigate the possibility of the department using a paperless system when issuing teachers salary and pension dockets. Um, are members content to note that and write to the department asking what consideration it has given to this proposal? Agreed. Yep. Yep. Agreed. Thank you. Um, item 712 on page 254 is the Invest NI Investing Activity Report for the department for January 2021. Um, item 713 on page 266 is correspondence raising concerns about internet and technology poverty and how this impacts the education of children and young people. Um, are members content to ask the department for an update on uh, what it's doing to combat issues relating to internet and uh, technology poverty? Agreed. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. And finally, Thank you. Um, item 715 on is a report from um, CCMS on nursery education. Members, yeah. Uh, yeah. Members content to review that report and bring any further actions at a, for a future committee? Absolutely. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, members. Okay. Thank you, Clark, for that. Um, shall we move to forward work program as well? And I'll just ask the Department of Education to feel free to give us some uh, notice as to when they're in place. But I heard the minister say that. They had been working to a 9.30 time scale. So, Clark, will we move to forward work programme and agree that as well? Sure. The forward work programme is at um, page 317 of members' packs. Everybody has that in front of them. <laughs> okay, members, can I seek your comment and endorsement of the forward work programme? As, was, as the clerk had mentioned, uh, next week we're scheduled to hear from Action for Children in relation to the Blues Programme and the Emotional Health and Wellbeing Framework and the Department of Education on the Curriculum Sports Programme, as well as Healthy Kids Oral Briefing. Um, again, looking at our, our focus on physical and mental health and wellbeing at this time. Um, and then Wednesday, the 24th of February, we're scheduled to hear from Parent Action on restraint and seclusion and from the Department of Education on restraint and seclusion and an issue that we've uh, been working on for some time. The rest of the forward work programme is, is set out there. Clark, I know that we mentioned previously we were hoping to include the voices of children and young people on Wednesday the 10th of March. So if members have particular organisations that they think would be good to invite to that session, the Northern Ireland Youth Forum, the uh, Secondary Stu Students Union Northern Ireland come to mind. Um, uh, I think people had mentioned Pure Mental as well. Pure Robbie, you want to come in there? Yeah. Pure Mental and I, and then there's a, another group of young people who have to work down the bottom of the community and the neighbours called Crisis Cafe. Okay. That should be fantastic. Sorry, I didn't catch that. Robbie, what are they called again? Somebody hasn't got the mics muted and a lot of feedback here. Um, Crisis Cafe. Crisis Cafe, thank you. Okay, and I think uh, the Youth Work Alliance have suggested some um, youth bodies that we might want to contact as well. So if anyone has any other suggestions, uh, let us know. And as Robbie says there, folks, if you try and mute yourself when you're not speaking, it might help with background noise. Chair, can I just, uh, on one of those items in the forward work plan, just uh, just a, an update um, from... Uh, my perspective on the business committee, there are, I think there's three all party motions which are signed at the moment, and the business committee is looking um, in, in the incoming weeks, perhaps, uh, of facilitating some of the, those um, all party motions or committee motions. And given that we have one on controlling the restraint, um, certainly I would hope that 
the, the timing of the, the 24th of February and subsequently a number of weeks after that, we may be able to get uh, into planning. That would be great, Robert. Um, if we, my, my thinking was if we needed to change that all party motion into an education committee motion in order to get it on the order paper, that that might be something members would consider. But if we're able to return to private members' business, then there may be two different ways to get it on the order paper. As you say, the, our evidence session is 24th of February, so sometime after that would be timely. Um, appreciate your uh, uh, business committee advice to the education committee. We'll appoint you our uh, business committee special advisor, Robbie. Thank you. <laughs> That's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think there's a couple of other issues there we might look at, RSE being one of them potentially. Um, if members have other ideas for education committee motions that can let us know. But are, are members otherwise uh, content to endorse the forward work programme as it is there, uh, notwithstanding any further suggestions or amendments down the line? Agreed? Yes, sir. Okay, Agreed. thank you. I'll leave any other business to the end of the meeting in case members wish to raise any items further to our evidence sessions. Okay, Clark, do we have the department with us? Um, the department are in the audience. No, they have just moved to the spotlight, so um, I think we have everyone now. Okay, I'll move us back to agenda item five then, members, which is our ministerial briefing. Um, I had advised you on the papers that were available to you previously, so can I just check in with the, the minister and um, that the officials and witnesses are in place, yes? Chair, yes, uh, we're here. I have um, Ricky and Karen are with me uh, on site. Janice are joining us by uh, uh, joining us by Zoom or, or sorry, down, down the line, sorry, in, in any event. I was just going to okay. check, Chair, in terms of, it seems to be an awful lot of echo still, I suppose, in that, in that with the sound system, but um, in terms of, obviously, uh, the committee's highlighted, obviously, the four issues, which we're happy to to talk through and have a conversation uh, with the committee on. I'm just wondering from that point of view, on those issues, do you want to take each of those um, separately and have it, or what, what, what format do you want? I'm, I'm happy to accommodate whatever. Yeah, what, what, what is your, what are your timings this morning, Minister? Well, I think, I think we're here, I think we're picked into about 11, so. Uh, okay, that's know, good, good amount of time then. Okay. It is, it is. Um, we, we've suggest, members have suggested that we might move straight to questions if you're content with that it is it is yeah. i'm just like put this way and i have no problem with that i'm just suggesting uh on the four topics are you going to take each in turn or you take them sort of holistically as the four and just get questions firing out i mean again i'm, I'm pretty flexible out any yeah. any direction i would need to be reminded by the clerk of the four topics because four signs four signs four signs optimistic minister well, <laughs> chair maybe it would help from from our end this was what what we have prepared up um, the four issues I think that have been uh, that we were aware of, I think the committee was, was interested, would be the concept of, um, if you like, redoing the, the academic year is one issue. Okay. Uh, secondly, we have follow up for any questions that people have in terms of uh, qualifications and examinations uh, situation. Thirdly, the issue around vaccinations. And fourthly, the specific issue of WJEC. Those are the four. Yeah. That, that, so any indicated to us? I, and, and I think they will definitely be covered in the course of questions, Minister. Okay. Um, so maybe we'll move to questions and you'll be you'll be well prepped on all those issues then. <laughs> okay, well, whatever. All right, thank you. I, I'll bring in the Deputy Chairperson, Pat Sheehan, to start us off. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks for coming along this morning, Minister. I want to ask you about three separate issues, and I'll try as be, to be as succinct as possible. Uh, the WJEC qualifications, uh, a recovery plan for the reopening of schools, and the vaccination programme for special schools. And, and first of all, on the WJEC qualifications, I mean, the narrative out there is that you felt slighted by the Welsh Board not informing you beforehand that they were cancelling exams this year. Uh, and uh, the, the talk is you threw the toys out of the pram. And the consequence of that, Minister, is that you've reduced options for students. Uh, some of these subjects aren't covered by any of the other examination boards. There was no consultation 
with teachers. And what you have done is created more uncertainty in a time when there should be more certainty for students. So I'm really asking you to revisit this issue. Um, uh, you know, unless you want to throw some clarification on the issue, but yeah. I mean, I think it's important that education policy isn't made on the basis of the minister having a hissy fit. Thanks. Well, okay, Vice Chair. Let me just we'll take each of, each of the issues in turn. It's not on the basis of, of any form of hissy fit. I have no, uh, no sort of um, personal, I feel either no personal slight or indeed uh, particular personal animus towards the issue. Mm -hmm. The issue, I suppose, is, is the concern. First of all, in terms of reducing options, we'll come to that. Well, maybe I'll come to that in a moment. So the, the position is that the concern that has been there, uh, first of all, is that Wales is, appears to be in the, the process of going on a level of solo run. And one of the things that should be remembered, the position that they are taking as regards examinations this year in terms of the 2021 uh, examination is no bearing whatsoever on the WJEC qualifications because the concern actually arose out of the Welsh's, um, out of Wales's uh, examination of, um, uh, of what happened, I suppose, in 2020 and the Welsh Government report. And I suppose within that, uh, they talked about, the report recommends um, about robust discussion and about how this was an opportunity to move away from the current examination system. Now, the concern would be as to the long-term trajectory of uh, Welsh examinations and WJEC examinations, and I'll come to the point WJEC directly in a moment. And the fact that, that effectively they unilaterally appear to be potentially in the route of detaching themselves from that. Now, mention is made in terms of options and about limiting choice for students. Now, the position is, just to clarify, anyone doing an exam, Anybody entering a course this year will not be in any way impacted whatsoever. The position actually is to look, uh, and we have to give uh, a circular of advice around about the December, January period each year to schools in terms of the boards which are doable. There was decision taken a number of years ago that WJEC as regards GCSEs was not to be something which was to be uh, adopted in Northern Ireland. So there is a level of, of precedence uh, within that. And what has been Put in, put in place is at this stage, and it is something which is entirely under review uh, constantly, that the scenario is that, that effectively entries with effect uh, at AS level from September 2022, we are not, uh, we're advising that, that there is a concern over that. That comes, I think, from the, the regulator um, in connection with that. What will that mean in practice if things simply carry on as they are at present? Well, it will mean that uh, not simply, for instance, anybody, uh, say, completing A-levels in 21, 20, anyone completing AS or A-levels in 21 will be covered. Anybody entering either AS or A-levels under WJEC in September 2021, and therefore due to complete those exams in September 22, would be covered. Similarly, anybody doing an AS in 2021 and entering um, A-level, AS, or sorry, A2 level, in uh, September 2022, we'll complete them in 2023. So there is plenty of time for a situation where Wales can, can rectify this situation. The other, the other two points I would make on it, um, Pat, in terms of the WJEC. WJEC operates with, with two limbs to it. So they produce um, WJEC um, exams which are badged under WJEC those are the exams which appear to be um, under a level of movement effect because effectively... Sorry, Minister, Sorry, Minister. could, could uh, uh, apologise for, for interrupting you. Uh, you'll appreciate we only have a limited uh, okay, amount sorry, of I want to make this point. On any of the examinations that, that the course is in relation to, it, there's at least three examination boards uh, doing it. WJEC also bads themselves under a, under a different title, which provide, largely speaking, external examinations uh, under EDUCAS, they are effectively Welsh examinations put through that route, and there is no particular bar on any of those moving forward on that basis. And as I indicated, because this is something which would not take effect for um, actually another uh, 19 months, I think, before that would due to take effect on it, 
if there is an opportunity where there is clarity from Wales where they can show that they are still going to be compatible with the wider national picture as regards examinations, there is still the opportunity for reinstatement on that, on that basis. But we need to be assured of the, the quality of the, uh, of the exam process that we have for students in Northern Ireland. OK, well, uh, th thanks for that. I mean, it doesn't really answer the issues that I raised with you. And I, I would ask you to consult with teachers around this issue and, and to revisit it. But I want to move on to uh, the issue of a recovery programme when schools reopen. And I, I want to acknowledge the fact that uh, you did set up the Engage programme uh, and other programmes as well, uh, albeit it had fairly limited budget and to some extent was only scratching the surface of the problems. But you'll be aware that Professor Siobhan O'Neill was in with the committee last week uh, and she agreed with the view that there's a tsunami coming at us in terms of well-being and uh, emotional problems um, among our children and young people. And we're facing into an unprecedented crisis in our schools, and that demands an unprecedented response. And what we need is a cohesive and integrated strategy that's properly funded, not, not piecemeal, not ad hoc or made up as we go along, and not a disjointed uh, strategy, because I listened to officials last week talking about the different bits and pieces of funding here and there, and my head was dizzy by the end of it. We need a proper integrated strategy, uh, and the person responsible for that is you, Minister. And I want you to tell us here today what your plans are for reopening schools and recovery and dealing with the 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 emotional uh, and well-being issues as well as kids who are falling behind and they're learning and often uh, those two groups are are, are, are uh, cross-cutting thanks oh, okay thank you pat um and there's there's a lot in that so you you will forgive me i'll i'll, I'll try and deal first of all as regards the reopening of schools um the executive will be taking broader decisions in terms of reopening. That will also involve the issue of reopening of schools. There are uh, discussions even this week, um, for example, with health, uh, with uh, trade union side, uh, with stakeholders on that. But it's the executive that will take a decision potentially around the 18th of February or shortly thereafter. I think we want to be in a position where the position post the 5th of March, we can give a level of certainty. So from that point of view, there's, there there isn't anything um, definitive at this point because ultimately no decisions have been taken. I want to see, uh, I think it is right for, and I agree with you a lot of the range of, of issues that, that you've raised, from both an academic and a well-being point of view, the sooner that we can safely get children directly into schools themselves, I think, I think the better. You mentioned in terms of the, uh, the situation in terms of um, academic and well-being uh, recovery. What I would would say is I have made it clear whenever I think the last executive paper was put, uh, which extended remote learning to the 5th of March, it I suppose had a three prong to it. One was about the extension, secondly about an aim to get children back. But the third point was to accept, get in principle, the acceptance from uh, the executive that there needed to be a recovery program, which again was accepted by, uh, by the, the uh, executive as a whole. From a financial point of view, what would that need to cover? It particularly would need to cover uh, an academic level of recovery. That is both in terms of uh, a rollout similar to Engage, uh, which I think where it was able to be put in place has been successful. I think the one problem Engage ran into was probably during this term with, because a lot of schools had, had if you like, had worked out their strategy on the basis of direct face-to-face -face teaching in terms of Engage. And some of that has been clearly disrupted by uh, the events of the last month or so. Uh, it involves, and it will need to involve a level of recovery during the, the summer through uh, financially supported uh, voluntary work through schools and other organisations doing that. And it will need to involve then funding for uh, well-being. And indeed, there was a precedent set uh, that we got uh, a funding for a scheme in terms of in terms of well-being last year. That will go alongside the amount of money which this year uh, we have mainstreamed directly within budget, which is an extra five million from ourselves and a million and a half coming directly from health into that. Now, in terms of the ambition of the scale of that, certainly I think from that point of view, I can certainly be as ambitious as anybody. Realistically, 
the funding for that is likely to come through the COVID money for 21-22 in terms of as a broad recovery program, because as uh, your colleague, um, the finance minister, will, will explain at the moment, we're pretty much in the position where across the board there's flatline budgets. Now, if the education budget is increased significantly, I can increase uh, a lot of those programmes significantly. But I cannot find, I cannot get money which isn't there on that basis. But I will be putting into the executive a paper dealing with that um, both academic and well-being um, recovery bit and looking for a package that would be funded specifically out of COVID, out of the COVID money. Okay, not Minister. The fact, yeah, not Minister, 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 Minister and, de and Deputy Chair, just need to cut across you that we're out of time there. Pack, you Chair, make a very concise closing comment. Yeah. yeah with one final point and yeah. for a final question thank you uh, and, and and i understand the financial position minister is disappointed we're facing into more tory austerity but an integrated strategy is going to have to deal with other issues apart from finance you know in west belfast the west belfast partnership carries out excellent work outside of the normal school setting and you need to also utilize the community and voluntary sector and sporting organizations so that we have a cohesive integrated strategy that deals with academic issues as well as well-being and psychological problems as well. Thanks, Thanks. Pat. Okay, and, I, 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 uh, and Minister, I'm sure Minister, Minister yeah, you might, you, I'm sure you'll have opportunity to draw a wee bit more on okay. some of the other questions. Can I bring in Robin Newton, MLA? Thanks. Thanks, Pat. Robin, I think you might need to unmute there, sorry. I don't think I don't think we can hear you just Peter, yet. Peter, you wouldn't, Peter, you wouldn't get a glass of water just. Sure. The streaming's not working. Can we hear Robin there? No, not yet. Robin, if you if you can check your your audio there, I'll bring. Ooh. Sorry, that's you. That's you now, Robin. Go ahead there. I had Thank to get you. technical help there, Chair. <laughs> Thanks, Robin. <laughs> Uh, can I uh, welcome the, the, the Minister and his team uh, to the meeting? And I, I would just like to take up on uh, three questions, if I, if I can, Minister. First of all, just to continue the, the uh, concept of the academic year uh, and a, a bit further around that. Uh, and I know the budget ha has been mentioned uh, and uh, the Deputy Chair referred to the involvement of all uh, of a number of other uh, organisations, uh, and I think it's a, an area of agreement with. But in developing the concept, uh, Minister, uh, obviously you've mentioned the finance minister, but obviously the health minister and the communities minister also need to be on board uh, as this programme uh, might be developed uh, and rolled out. Can I just ask, uh, Minister, in terms of how uh, you're presenting a paper to the to to the executive, um, and uh, whether or not your officials have had any uh, conversations with uh, health uh, and communities uh, around the, the rollout of this uh, concept? Uh, on, do you want to deal with that one, and then maybe take the other thing? Yeah, I will do just briefly. I think there will be a need for a range of organisations to step up. I suppose the point the point I was making very specifically as regards um, recovery. Sorry, if you just give me a second here. Um, as regards recovery, particularly, I suppose, if we're looking at some of the summer side of things on it, uh, there is a clear role where, and we did use last year, I think roughly about 50 schools volunteered uh, and were then funded to provide uh, academic summer activities. I think if we're to reach out the maximum amount of that, I think we'd be looking to organisations beyond simply schools. In addition to that, I think there is clearly a role for health and communities on what way they can also support uh, young people. So we'll have that conversation both at officials level and also um, within the executive. Can I, can I just ask, uh, Chair, in, in terms of... of um, uh, it, to roll a program like this out across Northern Ireland is ambitious, and it may well be, sure that parts of Northern Ireland may pick it up and be extremely enthusiastic and an excellent delivery, 
and other areas where it may fall uh, with not such enthusiasm, minister. So some students, pupils may benefit, other students, pupils may be left behind in that situation. Well, no, uh, what, what I would say is, no, I don't think, Robin, that, that will be the case. Look, there are specific interventions which would be short term during the summer. And the aim, I suppose, is, first of all, to seek as part of that um, schools that would volunteer to do stuff, uh, do some stuff over the summer by way of intervention. But the idea is, I think we want to look and see whether that that shouldn't necessarily be confined to schools. It would be a, an academic catch up, a teaching catch up on that, that basis. There's others that contribute in that, in that side of things. The principal academic um, catch up would be probably something similar to where we've had with Engage. There, there would be a need to roll that out during the, um, the full financial year on that basis. So the, the driver for that and the provider of that would largely be schools, particularly drawing, I think, giving opportunities um, in terms of that additional teaching that can be provided um, for uh, particularly schools, as they have done under Engage, been able to bring in, for instance, a range of substitute teachers. Um, so, that, I mean, you know, while there would be opportunities, I'm sure schools could look at if, if some of their staff wanted to do overtime or whatever. I'm conscious of the fact that, that there has been a very both a tough time for teachers and will be an ongoing tough time. So the more, um, uh, if I could use a football analogy, the more fresh legs we can bring onto the pitch, um, I think the better on, on that side of things. Because uh, that any form of um, sort of renewed engaged programme, um, uh, albeit whatever way supplemented, would be brought in, that would then be that there would be a level of funding that would be available to every school with particular higher levels of funding available on the basis both of size, but particularly the higher levels of funding on the basis of where there's greater levels of social deprivation. Because uh, I think, again, uh, while it's not an absolute, I think the concern would be those who are most socially deprived from a, an educational point of view would probably have suffered the most during COVID. Okay, well, that, that certainly is a, a concept. I think uh, certainly I could uh, buy into, Chair. Uh, I, I, wonder, I wonder, could you perhaps update the committee on the vaccination uh, programme and particularly okay. with it's around the uh, special needs schools? Well, look, what, what, what I'll do is I'll just I'll briefly I'll maybe bring in Ricky, who's been dealing directly uh, with this. Obviously, the, the position was, it still remains uh, my position. I want to see prioritisation for teachers, but very specifically for special schools. Concerns obviously were raised by the Department of Health that they want to ensure that whatever programme is there in general, that it is something that, that very strictly follows the JCVI uh, or J okay, the, right. Yeah, JCVI. I was always trying to make sure I get the initials the right way around. And so the idea of something that simply rolled out to everyone was something that health was resistant to. The executive took a view that they wanted to have a consensus. So um, what health have, have uh, offered, and we've seen this as at least as the first cohort then, is um, I think targeting um, a range of, first of all, that there would be a range of children where there needed to be interventions with them, and therefore a range of staff arising out of that. But in terms of the up-to-date position, I'll maybe hand over to, to Ricky just to, to um, outline where we are with that. Uh, thanks, Minister. So the staff that we've received the vaccine would be those who are directly involved in the care of children and young people with the most complex health care needs and who are deemed clinically vulnerable to severe, the severe effects of COVID. Um, so it would be those who work in close proximity for prolonged periods of time, providing a range of interventions, which would include personal and intimate care uh, and evasive procedures. So we have a list uh, of those clinical procedures that those staff would be involved in. It's not an exhaustive list. The current position is that Community paediatrics are identified as extremely vulnerable children. That list will be finalised by the public health agency uh, and then shared with the education authority. And from that, the schools will be identified and therefore the staff who support those children will be identified. So I have a further meeting with the deputy chief medical officers uh, this afternoon. Uh, to get an update on where they've got to with that process. That is, at this point, a health-led process. Um, I would be hopeful that by the end of this week, we'll be in a much better position in terms of identifying both the children and the staff, and we can then move forward to vaccination as quickly as possible. Good news, 
Can I very quickly then, before my time runs out, maybe an update on the Engage program and particularly again with uh, the emphasis on special needs schools? Well, yeah, there's money being made available round about uh, about three hundred thousand, roughly. Uh, I think made available to uh, special needs schools, as you know, don't uh, look after directly their own budgets done through EA, but that would be uh, part of part of that as well. In the broader bit of Engage, I think there's been a considerable level of rollout. As I indicated, I think one of the problems, though, has been that this term, a number of schools had particular plans worked out for the January uh, January onwards period, some of which have not been in the position entirely to be delivered, which, apart from else, is an added reason why there needs to be um, uh, there needs to be sort of a furthering of the program. Uh, I think sort of during the financial year of 21-22, and broadly drawing distinction between that and the school year, so we actually would be looking to do stuff over the, the summer. And indeed, in terms of any, again, uh, because while I think the intention was always that EA would develop separately, uh, I think that whenever further proposals are brought to the executive for that 20, uh, 21, 22, uh, there'll be a direct sort of upfront commitment on that within that paper uh, to special schools directly as well, while appreciating that for most SEN children are actually in, in within mainstream schools in terms of the help that, that, that they're getting. And yeah, and just to add to that, the special school program itself has not yet started. We are subject to final business case approval. It is at an advanced stage. As the minister said, the funding has been secured, so we hope to be moving forward with that as soon as possible. Okay. Uh, thank you, Minister. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Robin. Can I bring in Daniel McCrossan, MLA? Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Chair. Um, Sorry. Uh, Minister, uh, an increasing number of people are uh, writing to my office uh, each and every day, and indeed this committee has received uh, letters as well, asking why the Department of CA did not have a ready-made contingency plan for the cancellation of exams in 2021. It was clear from last year that such an eventuality was a distinct possibility and that the ramifications would be massive. We've been told that it uh, was so obvious that due to the mounting levels of disruption and the lack of uh, data, it uh, will be even more difficult to award grades. Consequently, early ministerial direction was essential. We made this point continually to you, uh, Minister, and, uh, uh, and I, I, get, I get the situation that we're in. Can you explain your rationale uh, for not having commissioned a plan B to be ready in time for the commencement of the current ac academic year or shortly afterwards? Well, with respect on it, to be able to make a judgment, I think there's two things in relation uh, See, we're told uh, last autumn to start preparing up uh, contingency plans in the event that, that um, examinations, uh, you know, would not be able to, to take place if that was that contingency. They always indicate that the best possible route is for exams to take place. To be in a uh, scenario, uh, and, you know, with respect in terms of the level of work that is required in this, the, leg, the level of the fact that even in terms of some of the, the stuff there is, a range of legal problems which always need to be to be overcome. This is not something which you write on the back of a cigarette packet or indeed produce on a like a one sided A4. There's an awful lot of work uh, within that. So they were, from a contingency point of view, from last autumn, they've been working on that. That was ready to roll whenever um, the position was indicated. And that's why the detail was able to be revealed in, in January for this June in connection with it. We see in other jurisdictions, uh, Wales is still trying to sort out where it is. Scotland, I think, is still working on stuff. England, I think, is still at consultation. Um, I think as far as I'm aware, I think probably the Republic of Ireland is still on the position at the page where I think they're still doing exams, but it could be corrected. Um, and I think that, that's the case as well. So we've moved, I think, quicker than any jurisdiction in relation to that on it, Justin, but it does require a considerable amount of work. And the idea that, that frankly, to be able to judge... Um, where you are in the following June from the previous September and have it have everything in place for September, uh, I think would be um, I, I think that would be certainly a premature notion uh, within that. So look, I, I think everything um, is being put in place. I think the work has been done um, in connection with that, and direction was given a considerable time ago, and that work is is being brought uh, to fruition on that on that basis. Minister, I think I think we'll all appreciate that most schools uh, accepted that there wasn't going to be exams, and most believe that you just didn't move 
quickly enough in relation to this. Well, you, you well, with respect, with respect, with respect, that's not what we were getting out of the stakeholders whenever we spoke to them. And indeed, for instance, whenever prior to Christmas, there was the revealing of the slim down um, uh, sort of curriculum um, ask, if you like, related to it. That was something which was supported, I think, broadly speaking, by any of the stakeholders from across the system, be they selective, non-selective, be they from whatever whatever sector. So, you know, I, I think we've, we've, we've got to actually let the facts actually speak for themselves yeah. rather than... Daniel, yeah, and, uh, Daniel and Minister, if I, if I come in briefly there as well, the, the Secondary Students Union of Northern Ireland report on mental health survey has established that the delay in decision-making on exams caused anxiety for the pupils that responded to their survey. Wales' decision was taken on the 10th of November, and our decision, I think, was taken on the 6th of January. So I think, with, I think Daniel's with point, respect, respect, I think Daniel's point and with pertains. Respect, and with respect, uh, Chair, on the Wales' decision, they're still trying to actually work out what they're doing. They've actually then effectively been plunged back into uncertainty, at least possibly once, possibly twice in, in relation to that. So there's a level of uncertainty that's there being produced by Wales. Wales made an announcement on the 10th of November without anything to back up how they were actually going to do any of this. Okay, were, okay, uh, okay, uh, okay, okay, okay. So, let, me, let me bring Daniel back in, Minister. Thanks. Thanks, okay. Daniel. Minister, we're not going to, we're not going to agree on this, but certainly the stakeholders, if you want to call them that, that I'm speaking with right across Northern Ireland are not telling me what you're telling me now, and they would uh, fundamentally disagree with your account of events, uh, to put it very bluntly. But we'll, we'll, I'll ask you another point. L looking back, do you think that you should have given SIA, for instance, the resources to have uh, such a plan in, in place much sooner? And will you assure us that the guidance you now have uh, uh, you now issue in relation to how grades are to be arrived at will fully take into account the lack of hard data available for current cohorts facing GCSE, AS and A-level, and will you adequately support teachers in arriving at fair grades for all our children? Yeah, look, there'll be, there'll be full support. In terms of the guidance, uh, the guidance will be issued by CCEA um, to schools. Look, we've made it very clear, and that's why I think that in terms of the announcement, in terms of the data that can be used, I think one of the problems, and even one of the problems with necessarily getting absolutely fair grades, I think we're looking at trying to find the best possible solution, uh, you know, and whether this is this year, last year, or whatever, uh, one of the problems is because of the disruption of COVID, that has limited the level of, of data. What we are saying is the maximum amount of data uh, and any form of evidence, that's why we haven't produced something which says, here's a formula of you take this particular piece of data and weight that at a particular level, but it is actually holistically on the basis of the professional judgment drawing from from the evidence that, that is there and, and that will be something that will be there um from that i think in terms of uh resources i think there's been sufficient resources have been supplied it's just you know there are a range of things at times where you can put all the resources in the world you won't it's not a question of um you double the resources you have the time in which things can be produced there are a range of things which have to be gone through work has to be done and it's also you can't simply even draw the individuals um, off the shelf to be able to do uh, particular things. So there are limitations, there are practical limitations within that. But certainly I think SIA have had uh, all the level of uh, resources that will be needed. And similarly, I think uh, any support will be provided uh, that is needed to the teachers. But they're, they're providing a professional judgment on the basis of evidence, um, externally assessed then uh, from that point of view, or externally monitored, if you like, from, from SIA's point of view. Okay, uh, Minister, I wanted to talk about uh, transfer tests uh, and I'm keeping an eye on time. Um, now that you've seen the admission criteria produced uh, by uh, uh, 200 post-primary schools and have had the opportunity to lament the disadvantage caused to some children who are eldest in their families or who are the travelling community or who are in receipt of free school meals, do you not regret heeding the SDLP's call for this year only to use the additional powers conferred on you by the Section 38 of the Coronavirus Act. We've mentioned this, Minister. I've spoken directly to you in relation to it. Well, uh, sorry. To, you, could, you could, for example, have uh, through application of the least worst option approach uh, that you have favoured on other occasions. Well, Justin, as, as I think you and I were on a television programme a while ago, I think there's a couple of complications that I think trying to use, I think it would be legally dubious at best. I think it actually would lie outside the role of the Coronavirus Act to try and impose conditions. But I think you yourself, when pushed by a, uh, a certain sort of well-known um, journalist within Northern Ireland, uh, was asked what, would, what was actually the criteria that you wanted to see standardised across the system. 
and you simply said, I want to see a fair process, I want to see fair criteria. There is no consensus on what that criteria should be. Now, if the SDLP are saying, actually, a rule for a transfer test actually means that there is that level of certainty, uh, I, I welcome your Damascan conversion on that, on that basis on it. But there is no point, frankly, in simply saying, I want a fair process, I want fair criteria, without actually spelling out what those are. And indeed, I think legally, legally we're suggesting something which would actually go outside the remit of the legislation. The legislation in terms of the Coronavirus Act is, on, is really aimed at specific uh, areas uh, within that. And indeed, I think uh, any, any, attempt, any attempt to go beyond that, you know, you're asking me to impose a solution with me, which I think are our best, our best dubious, and frankly, and frankly, also on that, on that basis, to which you don't have a clue what those okay, okay, would be. Okay, Minister, thanks, Daniel. I think that's a no regrets, if you want to make your final question and comment. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. With, with respect, Minister, the coronavirus powers that you could use, uh, you could use them, Minister. These coronavirus powers have shut down our entire society. So with respect to you, you could use them, and you could use them to the advantage of children. And there's a number of points. Like you, you could have, for instance, required the eldest child to be considered on a par with those who have family members already attending. You required the eldest child to be considered before those with former siblings and former parents having attended. Required schools to accept the same percentage of children on free schools meals or from the traveller community as they currently have registered. I also note that some schools minister, have used uh, criteria from non-recommended section uh, of the Department of Education guidance in 16-15. Uh, uh, do you have any processes in place to check if these schools had regard to your guidance before pr uh, pr proceeding uh, to so blatantly disregard it. And also, if you find that a school has not demonstrated that they have had regard uh, uh, to your guidance, will you remove indemnification from them as you have the power to do so, Minister? These are important points. Good questions. Yep. Okay, Daniel. Okay. And, okay. Minister, yeah, just, sorry, just the point that you've said that there's no easy fix to this. There's not, and we all accept that. But there are... And, so, and, from, and, from, and from that point of view, I'm glad that... And I don't know whether what you've just read out constitutes then an SDLP proposal for a criteria, but... Minister, Minister point, let, me, let me... Sorry, let me pause you, Minister. Let me pause you. I want on some degree of order to this, OK? It, it's a good question that Daniel has asked. I, I, Daniel, if I'm not wrong in summary, you're asking, um, does the Minister not regret directing the use of Department of Education recommended criteria yeah. and yes. to try to... and yes. to try to prevent the use of non-recommended Department of Education... Um, criteria, the like of which has been seen in a number of schools. So it's not yeah. about SDLP, Minister. Okay. It's about okay, it's chair. about the criteria. Do, do you do you chair, regret I'll, not I'll directing make, that chair, criteria? Chair, Thank we you, have chair. made it very okay. Sorry, if we can answer the question, we've made it very clear to, to to schools what we recommend as criteria and what we don't on the basis of schools are using non-academic criteria. The position is legally, the authority and indeed the power to set criteria lies with the schools themselves. That is not something which the department can simply override. That would require, for instance, under the 2006 Act, a situation in which the assembly would have to take a view, for instance, on academic selection before for, any for this year, goes, for this year only okay. potentially, for this year only potentially. No, no, strictly, strictly speaking, you can only trigger the, the the under the the powers under 2006 could only be triggered legally once actually the the the, the assembly has taken a firm position directly and voted through a position okay. on academic selection. And I think it would lie outside. I think it would not survive any form of legal challenge if we were to try to impose. But also okay. the point the point, the point, point that has been made, um, Justin makes reference to things being on a par. The whole point with criteria is they need to be effectively in a ranked order because you're deciding between uh, students. So essentially, if you're saying this criteria puts you in this place, this puts you in an equal place, then that doesn't actually solve the problem of, of who is admitted to a particular school and who isn't. Understand. I think that I, it's safe for me to speak on behalf of Daniel, and he's run out of time as well. But I think Daniel's point was that a criteria could be sibling and or eldest child. Okay, I think that was his point. But look, I think your bottom your your bottom line point, Minister, is you your conclusion was you did not have the power to direct yeah. criteria. So discussing yeah, the criteria yeah. is using up time that we don't have. Daniel, I'll allow you a very, very concise final point, given the yeah. amount of time has been given on answers to you, but we That's need to move on. Go ahead. I expected the minister to give the answer that he gave, but the minister must appreciate that due to COVID, he has reduced legal requirements on the Department of Education and EA to provide vital services to the most vulnerable children uh, to a best endeavour status uh, when it suited them. 
So yeah. why did the minister not, in this instance, do the same to ensure a much greater degree of fairness and ambitions uh, uh, remains a mystery to, to, to us all? Like, well, maybe, maybe, maybe because, you could have maybe been minister if you wanted to. No, Daniel, it, the Coronavirus Act is not simply a device which you can do whatever you want with it. There are clear, there are clear indications. There, no, sorry, there are clear indications. If you read the full act within that, you will see there are clear indications that there is a purpose to the act. That there is, uh, there are aims of what can, can and can't be done. There is specific. Unfortunately, we had to be in a situation for a short while uh, earlier on in the year where there was a limitation because of certain level of practicalities. That is something that is directly allowed within the act. It's something that is done with a great deal of reluctance. Imposing academic, uh, sorry, non-academic criteria or academic criteria or criteria on schools where there is a clear legal responsibility of schools is something that would be clearly outside the act. So okay. you ask me why I do one rather than the other. The reality is that, that one, ultimately, uh, I was forced to reluctantly because of circumstances, but I had the legal power to do. The other, I didn't. OK. That's, that's Daniel Robbie Butler, MLA. Robbie Butler. Yep, chair, sure, thank you. Thanks, Robbie. Yeah, cheers. It just takes a wee second or two to come in. Minister, just um, uh, on Daniel's last point, the public record will be very clear. Uh, which parties and which individuals actually had the P7 pupils at heart with regard to solutions and seeking a, a fair a, a fair outcome. I'm not going to ask you any questions on the cohort that's been passed because people are very aware of the discussions, the public discussions and those that, that were prepared to put up uh, uh, ideas. But we do have a cohort uh, of P6s at the moment who will be um, coming in uh, uh, very shortly uh, in September time into P7 with the, possibly the same problem ahead of them. That's just a very brief question, Minister. Is it your intention to do the same as you did this year? Or will you be looking to improve uh, and, and maybe make clear some very clear contingencies? You know that, for instance, last year I, I had one on the table, which was bring it back to primary, which I can put on the table now. It's something that I will be trying to do if we're going to be in school and doing tests. Secondly, then, if COVID is still a real threat um, and children are, are losing out again, would you be minded to do the same thing again? Or will the system be improved? Uh, to, to take into, uh, into consideration what we've learned this year. Okay, look, Robbie, thanks, thanks for that. Uh, I think in terms of, uh, and look, I appreciate as well that that while various ideas didn't work, I know that you were constructive in your suggestions. I suppose part of the issue then was that schools, as they have the legal responsibility, did take that advice and most find that the the routes that could involve some level of academic selection outside of a transfer test weren't really tenable, which was why. Uh, the bulk of schools took that, that view. Uh, certainly from the point of view, I know that um, I think it's already been an announcement, certainly from AQE, may well be that, I don't know, or PPTC, that their intention is to do the transfer test in November. I, I think we would all hope to be in a position where we're in a lot better situation. And what it did actually last year indicated that certainly from an academic selection point of view, that to have an entirely fair level playing field or something that's robust, there isn't really any... Um, alternative other than transfer test of academic selection is, is to be used. And I think also this year has been demonstrated that for those who would simply banish academic selection without any form of, of alternative shows that the difficulties that are there. Uh, look, I'll be with you. Uh, look, I'm, I'm happy to work with others, including yourself, in terms of any help that can be. There are legal constraints on the basis of what actually lies legally within the powers of uh, boards of governors uh, of schools. They will have to. In terms of the, the primary school side of it, uh, you know, as indicated, I've absolutely no problem. I've been very supportive of, of tests being brought back to primary schools. Indeed, in my previous tenure um, in 2016, there was a long-standing, um, I don't know how maybe strong as to say a ban, but certainly a memorandum to primary schools saying you're not to do this. That was lifted during that. So there's absolutely no bar on it taking place in primary schools. However, I think uh, both in terms of the organisation setting the test, but particularly I think there is there would be considerable resistance, I think, to be fair, within within a lot of primary schools, to actually having the test within that. There would be a lot of principals. I know it's the position, certainly, of all the, the main teaching unions that are opposed to the test taking part in primary schools. And I suppose the only issue, but I'm more than happy to have discussions in, in relation to this, the only issue in terms of the venue side of it is, I think it would be inequitable if tests took place, and they took place in some primary schools, but not in others, because I think that would give advantage to some pupils over others in terms of the I, test. 
I, I, I just agree with that. And with a short in time, I'll agree with that, Minister. I, I mean, I, I think it's an, an incumbent on all of us to remember what happened here. Uh, there will be about 23,000 children transfer, 16,000 of them had entered into AQ and GL. So what we what we did was we affected those who had in good conscience and, and entered into a, um, a competition and we didn't let them see it out. So the same probably, the numbers stack up some somewhere similar every year, I think. We have to exhaust ourselves in doing the best for those children who who choose to do that with their parents. And I do agree. Yes, primary schools. I know some of some of them, my friends. I'm on the board of governors myself at the school. I need to be careful. But this is about the children. This isn't about the school. It's not about an ideology. It's about those pupils uh, having a, a fair crack at the whip. Um, I'll move on. If that's okay, Minister, um, because we're limited for time. So there's yeah. Did you want to come in there, Chris? No. Oh, sorry. No, okay. Go ahead. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So last week, obviously, Minister, and you're probably prepped for this, there was the, the uh, discussion uh, and doing the rounds, certainly some teachers uh, in, the, in the media and union for being questioned on up about redoing an academic year. Um, then this week, the uh, the the czar uh, the in, in England has talked about, you know, summer schools and that type of stuff. Um, there's a fantastic article from the Evidence for Learning. And what it talks about is all of the children that have been impacted uh, will have raised anxiety levels, may have uh, been exposed to trauma, and certainly many of them have experienced bereavement. So we, obviously, we come into COVID with, uh, um, uh, in Northern Ireland particularly, with very poor rates of mental ill health, emotional well-being, and those type of things, which have obviously been exacerbated through COVID. So in terms of uh, any recovery and the age plus, uh, what, uh, what level of scope are you going to give um, to ensuring that we put the children in the space and the environment to learn? Because an anxious child doesn't learn well, a child who has been exposed to trauma doesn't learn well. What are we going to do to ensure that our children are in that space to learn the best that they can? Well, I suppose a couple of things have already indicated as part of that, that um, it's a mixture of both the academic and the well-being side of it. I'll be bringing a paper to the executive. There is academic catch-up which needs to take place. That, I think, means in, uh, thinking, uh, and we did some of this last year, thinking imaginatively also about what on a voluntary basis can be done uh, over the summer, uh, but also then tied in with that then as additional support in terms of, of well-being. That additional money would need to be um, I think funded directly through the, the COVID side of it. I think both those those elements of it, but also the fact that despite budget pressures, we'll be maintaining at least as well additionally the baseline uh, element of things of the money that that was able to be increased this year. So the the um, you know it wasn't as suppose prior to twenty twenty that that there was no support in terms of mental health and well being, but actually as as a result of the bidding that we made um, at the the budgetary process this time last year. We've effectively, and with help, additional help from health, been able to put in effectively six and a half million into additional into budget. That would be that is being baseline and mainstreamed um, within that. I mean, I could, but probably a fairly lengthy answer. So I'll maybe leave it to somebody else uh, to ask. In terms of uh, from a practical point of view, I know that there's been talk from a few people of effectively redoing the, the school year. Uh, that, to be honest, is something from a practical point of view. Uh, on a, for a whole range of reasons, but also educationally wouldn't be particularly sound for individuals. But there are there are a small number of individuals each year who will maybe repeat a year, for instance, and there is always that scope for particular individuals. But um, in general, it's not a, it's it, the educational experience that is drawn on that from here and elsewhere would suggest that's not generally speaking a good route to go down. No, and just final point, it's not a question, Chair, so hopefully you'll not, you'll not feel the need to interrupt me. Um, next week, we will uh, be having a session in the Blues programme. There are already, as you've said, there are already some investment into emotional uh, well-being and mental health. Obviously, you're going to extend that. I would ask you to extend it more and then any future uh, monitoring rounds, specifically in and around the, maybe the community and voluntary sector and mobilising them, not putting the, um, the, the, the burden on teachers to provide that that. That maybe that that uh, pastoral piece, they will restore the relationships as they do because it's a very important part of teaching. But there are some excellent programs out there. You can tune in next week and hear about one of them, uh, and, and perhaps that might be the, you know the tenant for any summer schemes. And you know if we look at I that, think, I think I think I think probably as regards to most, I suppose just there's obviously the two elements. That if it's largely speaking academic in through ever what format, it will be teachers providing it academically. Now generally speaking, I think any additional stuff. Probably is ultimately drawing on substitute teachers in, in you know whatever form. Yeah, I'm not talking about that. I think that the pastoral the pastoral well being side is largely speaking, uh, while not excluding education staff, while not excluding teachers, will largely I suppose be drawn by 
um, other means. But I, I suppose the issue is that if the best way of delivering that on the ground is for schools to be providing it, to some extent, schools will have the choice over how they apply the budget within that. Because I think we're also aware that whereas there will be certain schemes that will be mainstreamed, which apply across Northern Ireland, not always um, given sort of the complexity of uh, school age population, given the complexities of Northern Ireland, you know, what, what may work in the middle of Lisburn for a 14 year old may be very different from what would work in rural Fermanagh for a seven year old, you know, so it's, it's about giving that level of flexibility also to schools to be able to provide that, that level of support. Just, just to fill it's just in case it's cross purposes. I'm not talking about the curriculum. I'm talking about getting the young people in this space to do the, you know, to do the catch up and get the curriculum, which no. can be done over an extended period. It's just that that's that before you okay. get that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks, Robbie. Can I bring in Nicola Brogan, MLA? Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Minister, for um, your attention this morning. I have a few quick questions for you. The first one is on vaccination rollout for special schools. Obviously, we were all asking you um, to prioritise them, so we're grateful for that. But we've been contacted by a number of special school principals who have said since the announcement that um, um, that they have been given the responsibility to choose which staff within their schools receive the vaccine. First of all, do you think this is appropriate? And secondly, in the overall context of the vaccination program, surely the number of staff in special schools would be relatively small. And would it not make sense to offer the vaccine to all staff? And can you explain why that isn't currently the case, please? Well, OK, the position, Nicola, on that, yes, I, I think it would make sense to offer it to all staff. That would be my position. I also think it does put um, special schools principals in a difficult position. I, I pay tribute to the work they've done. The position was I put a paper to the executive which indicated that my preference was for all special school staff to do that. The executive felt um, from the point of view that they wanted a consensus on the issue. Health made it very clear that they were not, they were not prepared to support something which they felt went against the, the JCVI, which suggested therefore that, that they would be opposed to simply something which at this stage rolled it out across everybody. There was not, I suppose, across the full range of the executive, a willingness to put that to a vote and outvote health on that regard. There was a desire to have consensus um, within that. That meant that we had discussions with health. Health indicated that what they felt was consistent with JCVI. And again, you know, if it was purely left up to me, would I vaccinate every special school staff member? Yes, I would, but I don't have a stash of the vaccine in that regard. We can only work on what is, what is agreed by health. So health have identified that they believe that what is appropriate is for a range of children who have particular clinical vulnerabilities and a range of interventions that will be there from staff. They've listed, but not saying this is uh, limited to it, as Ricky indicated, I think a list of 16 interventions that, that would be there. Uh, now, the issue is the next step in that is identifying if it's not going to be all staff, which staff. I think where it does put special school principals in a difficult position, but it's difficult to see where there's a way around this, is if health is saying we will, we will only vaccinate at this stage, those who qualify under that, it is difficult, I think, for I think it'd be impossible for health to identify on an individual school basis who that applies to. And probably the only person who within a school is in a position to largely identify which staff carry out these functions uh, would be the, the principals. And that's where I think it is uh, an unfortunate position on it. But I suppose the choice to some extent um, from the point of view of what could be got out of health is either going down that route or at this stage, nothing happening at all in terms of the, the vaccinations. So I think what is there is the, the better option than, than it not being there at all from, from the point of view of special schools. But look, uh, my, my position consistently has been that, that, that teachers need to be prioritised and that, that in particular, I want to see all special school staff vaccinated. Yeah, I definitely think it's unfortunate that principals have to make that decision. And just uh, as much as say all teachers, I think all school staff should be prioritised. Which brings me to my next point that um Nicola, Nicola, can I just kind of really briefly before you move on, can I can I just check that we've got an answer from the department with regards to when um special school staff will be vaccinated? I might have missed it earlier from Ricky, but can I just I, check, I think, Minister? I think I think Ricky indicated well maybe I'll, I'll pass over to Ricky directly just in relation to that. Thanks, Minister. So uh, the clinically extremely vulnerable children chair are still being identified by the PHA. So um, I would, I'm getting an update from them this afternoon in terms of that process. 
then we'll work with the EA to identify the schools, then the staff that support those children will be identified. So um, I'm pressing hard to get a date for that. I don't have a definitive date, but I'm told that once the staff are identified, we can move to vaccination very quickly. Are we talking days or weeks or months, Ricky? Well, I, I like to think it would be days. Okay. But I'll, I'll have a better understanding of that this afternoon. Thanks for that. Sorry, Nicola, I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to move on to the next point of the vaccination rollout with um, early years nursery and child care providers. We know how invaluable their service is to to all of us um, and how important it's going to be with the economic recovery post-COVID. So can you tell me, Mr Weir, where they lie now with, the, the, with their prioritisation with the rollout of the vaccine? Again, I suppose arguably health could better directly answer it. The paper that I put in... Um, also encompassed when we talked about uh, the particular, look, I think um, if, if you, you look at it sort of in terms of the way the, the, the prioritisation, uh, look, certainly my view, and I think the general view is that prioritisation most needed to be there directly for the special schools, not simply, I think, because what we know is it's both a mixture of close contact and also probably age of spread. And so we know that, for instance, that generally speaking, there is less direct vulnerability from um, a very, very young child as opposed to, for instance, a teenager that would be there. And for the point of view that most special schools will operate up to 19, there, there would be then a level of vulnerability there. But what I indicated was that, that for anybody involved in childcare, early years in the broader level of, of teaching should be prioritised on, on that basis on it. Now, again, I think an executive took a view that the executive, that first of all, we could only follow JCVI guidance um, and that if a case was to be made by the executive to JCVI, it needed to be done at a more strategic level because, for example, there's a good argument that will also say, yes, include teachers, include childcare, but also I think, and it's a perfectly reasonable point, if you're looking strategically to say that, you know, should there be, for instance, a range of prison officers, police officers who have a, a level of intimate contact as well. So there will be further discussions on the executive directly within that. Within JCVI, they have indicated, I think, that... Uh, they are looking, first of all, to get uh, stage one out of the way, which are the most vulnerable within that. And I've indicated that there will be, I think, an, a conversation at JCVI and a national conversation. I see this coming, for example, from uh, Keir Starmer had said this uh, across the way uh, in relation to that. Uh, but JCVI have, have then talked about consideration of then in the second phase, prioritising people on the basis of professions. And they've, they've highlighted for instance, education, profession, childcare, et cetera, as part of that, along with some other side of things. So I think it's a very lively debate within that. Yeah. But the position is that, that health are purely going on what the basis of the prioritisation given by JCVI. So because JCVI haven't put a particular date on that, I'm not in a position to put a date on that, that either. OK, well, I appreciate you can't give a date, but I just would like to uh, engage with a number of childcare providers and uh, members of early years, um, like providers, and they do feel overlooked at the minute that their service isn't being appreciated, and that just simply isn't the case. We all know how important it is, so I want to raise that there. Nicola, Nicola, sorry to come in again, but your questions are so good today, and I'll make sure to give you the proper time afterwards. Can I just supplement that one briefly as well, Minister? Are, Minister, are you aware that there are some community and voluntary sector childcare providers that have received vaccination by virtue of holding contracts with the health and social care trusts. And there are obviously a wide range of other independent providers also inspected and regulated by health and social care trusts who have not been vaccinated, creating a, a, a disparity within the sector at this moment in time. No, uh, Chair, I'm absolutely aware of that. And I think it is something that, from that point of view, that, that is clearly, in terms of the position, as I understand it, and it has created, I think, a lot of waves and problems, understandably, within the childcare sector. As I understand that, um, health gave a sort of a directive in terms of where JCVI, in terms of the implementation of that at, um, at, at trust level, there were some trusts taking this in a different position to others some of which was, was then indicated to think there was arguably a mistake over. So I know that, for example, in the Western Trust, issued an email effectively to community and voluntary sector providers, and actually initially widened even beyond those they had a contract with, saying, you want to book a time for, a, for vaccination, come on in. 
Uh, that apparently was a mistake and was withdrawn. I'm aware, okay. I think, that within the, the broader childcare sector, I think the Belfast Trust got in contact with a range of, of organisations, some of which were childcare providers, and were offering a vaccine. That was not the case with other, with other trusts. Okay. Now, okay. to be fair, I don't think that's come from a Department of Health level. I think that, is, that went beyond what they wanted to see happening. But okay. it, doesn't, it doesn't help in the wider situation that people feel that no, they're not being treated equally with others. You know, so no. I agree with you on that, that point entirely. Uh, well, I think two, one, one of two actions needs to happen then. Someone needs to issue an apology if there was a mistake uh, and or the vaccination needs to be extended on a, a fair and equal basis. But let me bring Nicola back in because uh, she's been very graceful with me. Thank you, Nicola, and thank you for your questions. Okay, Chair, thanks. Um, Minister, I want to ask you also about the Engage programme. Um, I've been contacted by a number of nursery staff and preschool staff who feel they should be included um, in the programme, and I completely agree with that there. We know how important um, this kind of stage of educational development and social development and emotional development um, and the, this early year stage is on children. Um, so I think that they should, like nurseries, nurseries and preschools should be afforded all the resources um, and support that we can offer them. So would you agree with me that nurseries and preschools should be included in the Engage programme? Well, look, we'll, we'll look at whatever can be rolled forward in relation to it. I think the problem directly is the Engage programme is very specifically about academic catch-up. It's about uh, particular, as suppose, making sure that subject matters are, are covered on, on that basis on it. Now, I think to some extent, I suppose the only issue is it can always be looked at for nursery and preschool, whether it is directly as pertinent um, to them. I think there's an, an arguable case in relation to that. I suppose the issue is, given that money is finite, if money is going that direction, then it would be taking money away from um, other school part of the, the Engage programme. So I think that's the only constraint that is there. And I suppose it's about getting the best possible delivery within that. And I think the Engage programme, in terms of academic catch-up, um, may not be as well directed if it's towards very, very young children, would be my, my gut feeling. I know there is important developmental side of things, but a lot of developmental issues may be less about the direct academic bit. I think where some of the damage is being done amongst young children is probably their restrictions in terms of socialisation that is taking place and that ability, for instance, to meet together, to play together, to do a whole range of those things. That may not be quite the academic side of things, and I think... That's where a level of damage, and I suppose where simply money is not, it's about actually getting people in being the, uh, the particular uh, point in relation to it. Okay. Yeah. Well, the just final point, I do agree with you there that um, it may not be the academic effect that's having on the children, I'm sure, although I'm sure it has some effect, more like the social and um, emotional development, but I do think we need to um, provide them all the support and resources that we can. But thank you, Minister, for your time there. Thanks, Thank Nicola. You, Nicola. Su super questions, Nicola. Thank you. Uh, William Humphrey, MLA. Uh, morning. Uh, thanks very much. Morning, Minister. Um, thank you and the officials for coming this morning. Um, can I, at the outset of my remarks, Chair Karen Endus, as a member of the Scout Association, um, Minister, if schools were to open in the, sum the spring, then the summer months will be crucial to our young people. You know, um, given that we had the um, Professor O'Neill with us last week, the interim, interim mental health champion, um, I think the next number of months when schools open, if they open, will be crucial for our young people. Uh, not just academically and in terms of learning, but in terms of their mental well-being and their, their, their uh, activities in terms of getting them out and... and, and um, back into society in a way that they have been able to do for some months. So it's not just about schools, but it's about sports and activity, dancing, whatever it is. And obviously youth and uh, uniformed organisations are crucial around that. So if those summer months are going to be crucial, one of the questions I put to the um, uh, interim mental health champion last week was around the adjoint of approach for the summer. Now, I don't believe it's the, the Department of Education's responsibility solely because it's obviously going to be relevant the summer months. It cuts across government and therefore Department of Education, absolutely, but Department of Health, Public Health Authority, Department for Communities, local government, the EAU service, uh, organisations like the Scouts and the Guides, BBGB, uh, and the likes of the Belfast Activity Centre about getting our young people out. So... 
what is required of someone, a key person to lead all of that and pull all that together? First question, I suppose, is do you agree and uh, has work been um, progressing around those issues? Well, yeah, I mean, look, I think a couple of points I would make. Uh, look, I think you're right in terms of the the impact in terms of well-being. I mean, it's noticeable that, that if anybody reads, for instance, any of the medical documentation uh, around the virus, particularly as it, it impacts on children, not just from those involved with mental health, but actually call it, you know, directly on, on say, the likes of SAGE, uh, any arguments that they will, and I think, to be fair to the likes of Chief Scientific Advisor, CMO, any report, they will, they will always make reference to the fact that it's not purely about what the impact will be on COVID, that they have to take into account of the, the damage in terms of, of mental health. And to some extent, um, particularly this year, while there's a, a range of work that needs to be done in terms of academic catch-up, actually for a lot of children, uh, that remote learning has been done a lot better. And consequently, there is an argument that the, the, the loss of learning may be limited. But what is a lot more difficult to limit is actually the loss from a, from a well-being point of view. Because if you have children who are effectively confined to home, then they don't have those those opportunities. It's also why I think that in terms of that, there needs to be holistic solutions. It does need to go beyond the Department of Education. Uh, and I would say as well that from um, that point of view, I suppose the specific bits on the, the youth side, it should be remembered, albeit as a small proportion of the overall funding, that, for instance, whenever um, funding was got for COVID recovery, and the same will be the case um, for a, a second tranche of, of support, if we're able to get it from the executive, that where that money was provided in terms of, of well-being, it wasn't purely, while the bulk of it went to schools to provide on the ground, there was also money provided to the youth service to be able to uh, have uh, interventions in that nature. And also why I think it was critical uh, that we lobbied and got, again, funding uh, support then in terms of the outdoor activity centres, which was not just the issue of the fact that they had suffered um, a level of clear financial loss because of the COVID restriction, but also to try to make sure that they are, that they're not something, that they have to be something which is sustainable into the future, that they can't simply be uh, a resource which can simply be abandoned in that, in that regard. So yeah, it does go clearly beyond simply what's there in terms of education. Well, I think then the key thing is that um, it's important that coming across government um, and many of these outdoor education centres are obviously part of the education um, department's um, bailiwick in terms of the EA and so on, and in terms of youth service. But also you've got, you know, Crawfordsburn and Lowern and Ganaway and Ballyhornan and, and, and so on, owned by various uniformed organisations, which have been mothballed for some months and losing huge amounts of money. I think the important thing that we need to do is identify someone to lead all of this, um, I think, you know, I always refer to particularly my constituency in North Belfast and Greater Shankill. This is the other pandemic, uh, you know, mental health, general well-being, suicide awareness is, is a huge and growing issue. And, and we hear, hear the various terminologies used about the tidal wave that's coming toward us. So I think identifying someone to lead all of that would be good. I think getting resource from Department of Finance and communities, uh, local government and so on would be hugely, hugely important um, because you don't want to raise expectation and then the resource isn't there to actually deliver it. And I think the other thing as well, from the point of view of the likes of youth organisations and, and youth football and, and so on, is they will be looking to reboot. I mean, my own Scout District, we just did our census figures this week and thankfully they're only down 2%. We were very concerned about what they were going to be. Uh, but this is a, something which is written large across the United Kingdom. So they're looking to reboot as well. So actually, government can come in, work with those youth organisations, uniform organisations, sports clubs, to actually help them to reconnect with their members too. And I think there's a holistic approach there that everyone then is a winner around this. So I think the key thing is to um, identify someone to lead all of that. Uh, has any consideration been given to any of that yet? Well, no, I think look, the wider paper when it puts to the executive will talk about that cross departmental working. If, if we're saying thinking of a particular individual to give uh, leadership to that, I don't think there's been a name identified in that regard. And I suppose from that point of view, um, if even in terms of either in terms of providing somebody additional or uh, from that point of view, in terms of uh, those who I think would have key voices to be able to um, 
make suggestions to be helpful on this front that lie from outside the education sector. I think that, that we're very keen and very willing to take on board any suggestions that are, that are put in place in that, in that regard. Okay. Um, in, ter in terms of the, the wider issue then around mental health and suicide awareness, um, I think I think that um, obviously the interim um, health champion is crucial to all of this. I'm not suggesting she's the person, but I think she would be crucial as someone who government should be talking to her around the issue. Um, but but I think I think uh, to be honest with you, we need to ensure that going forward, and I'll finish with this, we need to have all of the key people around the table. Those not just from education. Uh, but ab about wider learning in terms of the, the youth organisations and those who work with young people, um, because this has been when I talk to to um, parents involved in, um, during this meeting, I've been getting messages from parents who are homeschooling. Uh, I know that's been very difficult and that's been traumatic for them as well. But it's equally been traumatic for the for for the children. And I know you're aware of that. And I know others, are, uh, you know, who are with you there from the department are aware of that. But I would just make the point that those who work with young people in the voluntary capacity are also aware of that too. And um, we need to, to help them to get back uh, to some sort of normality as quickly as possible, because it's good. It's good for the young people, yeah, but it's good for the country as well. Thanks very much, all of you. Thanks, Thank you. William. Thanks, William. Minister, in, in short, to supplement William's comments there, can you offer a school return date? Well, no, I indicated earlier on that my aim is to start seeing sort of um, recovery from the, the 8th of March in relation okay. to the, the indication, okay. I suppose the indication in relation to whatever, uh, if you like, my personal feelings or even the department's feelings, uh, ultimately in terms of the broader lifting of restrictions, lift uh, roadmap for recovery, which clearly will involve education on that, that basis, is something which the executive as a whole has got to take a decision okay. on. So okay. uh, I, I would say it would be another week or two away before that is okay. the okay. finalised. Okay, I still have Justin and Morris and hopefully myself um, to uh, come in. So if we could try and stick to about seven minutes. Justin McNulty, MLA. You're on mute, Justin, I think. Hi, thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, Justin. Ms. Ricky, Karen, Janice, um, good, good uh, morning. I hope you're all well. We've had a lot of talk, Minister, about the well-being of pupils and their mental and emotional well-being, and rightly so. How, how is the well-being of teachers? What is the well-being of teachers like at the moment? The mental well-being of teachers, emotional well-being of teachers, staff, school staff, and principals. How are they doing, Minister? Well, I think they're under very tough conditions on that basis, and no doubt they're trying to cope. And I think they, they have coped with a level of resilience at um, conditions which are not are not the norm. And we've seen this, I suppose, it fluctuating throughout the year. So I have no doubt that people are under a level of, of stress. I think that's one of the reasons why, and, and you're right in terms of um, that there has rightly been a focus on the well-being of our young people, but it also needs to go beyond that. And that was, I think, one of the reasons why whenever uh, the broader funding that was made available through COVID um, from the department was able to secure, for instance, this year, and we would seek for, for next year um, as well, on sort of well-being recovery from COVID, that, that we tried to put as, uh, as little boundaries or at least restrictions as possible. So that in terms of what schools could spend that on, there was direct interventions they, they could make for their young people but also, actually, there was an opportunities there for uh, them to use either part or all of that money going to for particular support mechanisms for for staff. That ultimately those lie within the health field, lying uh, you know on a range of, of interventions. But you know, uh, the one thing we don't want to say to schools is, uh, look, here's something for the young people. Don't dare think of of doing any level of support for your your own staff. I think uh, their mental health and well-being, I think, is. is as critical uh, as well. It's also why I suppose from that point of view, you know, one of the areas why we particularly looked in terms of, for instance, engage in terms of academic recovery, the principal model for that is largely speaking on school drawing in people from outside in terms of particularly substitute teachers, because that is a both benefit to the substitute teachers. But I think we are acutely aware that we don't want to create, and again, this is where the balance is to be struck. And while, for example, in terms of the summer side of it, we'll be looking particularly for volunteers, obviously people that will be paid 
a result of that, rather than trying to make things compulsory for, for schools, I don't think that's a particularly sensible route uh, as well. And I know there has been some discussion in England, which would, uh, you know, of the potential pressures that are there for schools if they're if they're looking to do something out of it, which is why I think we'd be looking to lever in what, what is additional, but also then those who are keen and willing to do additional stuff themselves rather than try to impose it on people, Justin. Okay, well, I think it's very important that we don't forget that the pressures that staff will be under, the pressures of teachers and principals will be under, trying to juggle teaching kids remotely, trying to juggle teaching kids in the classroom, trying to juggle homeschooling their own children. It's been enormous and should be, should be recognised. And any recharge program, which I've been talking about, should incorporate um, the well-being of teachers also, the well-being of staff also. And that recharge program, Minister, I want more detail on that. I want to see how that's going to be enacted and how it's going to be implemented in, in uh, coordination with teachers and staff, you know, emotionally, socially, physically, mentally, academically. Pupils all need help to recharge in every one of those aspects. And I want to know what, what bids have you made to the Finance Minister for a coherent, integrated programme that will be um, run out through schools when schools return to full schooling as normal? Well, yeah, and I've indicated, and I suppose, that to some extent, Justin, I suspect we're talking a very similar, uh, maybe the words may be slightly different, but we're talking very similar language. So when I'm talking about engage, I'm talking about uh, mental health and well-being and a sort of a, a package uh, around that. What I've said in relation to that is that this is about um, the bid for... COVID money for 21, 22. And I suppose one of the bits sometimes we can all fall into this trap within education. We're looking at the financial year rather than necessarily the academic year. So it's not necessarily stuff which will have to wait until September. I think it's important the more that can be got. We've got the executive to accept that point in principle. The detail of that then is being worked through to then be put. Uh, all this will be dependent upon the executive agreeing to a package and agreeing to a financial package that, that is there. And probably something that, that is ambitious enough, but also realistic enough to be able to cover that. In terms of the level of details, I think that will set the broad parameters. But as I said, I think it is also the case that it is important that um, we set those parameters, as indicated particularly during the summer work, would be involving other departments as well. But also we don't straightjacket that um, to the extent uh, that, you know, here is exactly what needs to be spent and exactly the way it's to be, to be spent, because I think there's a level of discretion that needs to be applied um, on the ground. And some of that will mean that... that, that OK, Minister, well, that, I was just talking, Minister, sorry, sorry to put up my time's on out here, but no, I hope you're making bids for the, the appropriate uh, funding for a, an integrated and uh, coherent programme that will be implemented in schools when schools restart. In terms of the GSCBA uh, clause, which people keep falling back to, how practical, how realistic is that in special schools? Uh, I, I know this has been discussed at length already, but special school teachers and staff are approaching me really, really worried, really, really annoyed, really, really upset that they feel they're going to be put in danger. They're, put, they're, they're second class citizens because some staff are getting vaccinated, others aren't. And in, practical, in practicalities, that just doesn't work in special schools. It doesn't work. Well, just, and, uh, just, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't disagree with you to a large extent what, what you said. The issue is that, that, that health control the vaccination process. So ultimately, that ultimately means, I suppose, there's only one of, one of two ways that that can be got round. Either we get agreement with health and what health are prepared to do on that, or health are overruled by the rest of the executive. And there is not, I have to say, I don't want to breach confidence. There, there is a desire amongst the executive to see a level of consensus on the issue, which means that they are reluctant to go into a position where health are on a different page. And, you know, that would apply that, that if people are going to overrule health, then I think across the executive would need within the executive to take a very robust position against health on that, on that basis. And I think there's a reluctance to do that um, across the board on that, on that basis. Justin. OK, well, one final question, Chair, bear with me. Um, Minister, there's a pathway for the current year 12, 13, 14 pupils in terms of examinations or their placements. I've been contacted by the parents in relation to um, year 11 pupils. You will appreciate they've been out of school for much of last year and uh, as a year 10 group. And despite them being out of school for many months, they've had to choose GCSE subjects. This year, as year uh, 11s, they've been out of school for the majority of time as well. Year 11 is the foundation year for GCSEs, exams next year. 
what specific plan do you have to support that cohort of students and that of pupils near this well, year and into next year, given that there, ha there is a plan for year 12, 13, okay. 14, but not for year yeah. 11? Well, I'll maybe look, I think, I think maybe Karen yeah. was looking, I'll just, pass, I'll just pass the microphone yeah. over to you. I think Karen wanted to come in directly on that, on that particular point. Yeah, just to, yeah, just to um, acknowledge, yes, that has been raised with us. It was raised during the consultation and everything. And what we've asked CA to do is to examine how best to adapt its qual qualifications for delivery next year to ease the burden and, as you say, reflect that ongoing disrupt, uh, disruption to teaching and learning. Um, so, and one of the things I think, you know, it's likely that learners will not be assessed across all the units of the qualification in 2020, you know, recognising that uh, they haven't covered all of the content to date, but they're going to come forward with proposals, hopefully before, by the end of March or very soon after that, so that we can give clarity to the system. Okay, well, this, this cohort feels feel like they're the forgotten cohort almost. And one very quick question. Substitute, or sorry, not sub, student teacher placement minister. How how has that been impacted in terms of the the ability to train up student teachers for readiness to come into the workforce? Uh, well, uh, look, uh, just now get back to you on the detail. Obviously, uh, student training, indeed, even in terms of the teacher workforce, would fall under economy on that basis. Our role is actually simply to, largely speaking, as regards teacher training to. Um, for want of a better word, set the numbers and suppose maybe have an input in terms of the curriculum side of things. But uh, look, I, I think rather than try to, we'll, we'll get you, we'll get you some detailed answers that we'll maybe, I think we may need to coordinate with some of our colleagues from Economy just directly on that on that front as well. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Important questions. Um, Morris, Morris Bradley, MLA. Thank you, Chair. Uh, an awful lot of the questions that I had written down here have been answered, uh, but. A couple of wee things I'd like to bring up, and I can ask, ask a minister. Uh, he's alluded to a date. Uh, the start is really dependent on the, the, the executive making a decision on the February 18th. Could he clarify that uh, the actual restart date is out of his control? Uh, and does he think that if a decision is taken on February 18th, that the, that gives him enough time to contact schools and teachers for a restart date on March the 8th? Does he think he has enough time? Well, yeah, I mean, I th look, I think, uh, broadly speaking, the measures that need to be put in place. Now, we have worked um, on, for example, around, around a range of issues which are, largely speaking, have been ready to roll for, for some time in terms of some of the additional mitigations. So uh, we're uh, being in a position, for instance, on the special schools, we've already seen the first rollout of test and tracing within those. And I think the idea is to have those within all special schools, um, you know, within the next couple of weeks uh, on that basis on it. We have worked on stuff, for instance, as regards signage on the, the school gates, which would be ready, which also could be a reminder to parents. Um, EA are working with us and they are ready to roll in terms of, uh, call it a level of, of additional compliance checks on uh, school buses. Um, the position has obviously been made clear in terms of mitigations within schools, in terms of face coverings. And to some extent, I think that that um, if we can get a situation now, um, the executive is due to take, I think, a wider position as regards things on the 18th, whether or not everything will be nailed down as regards education that day, I, I don't know. But I think we need to be in a position that probably is a minimum that there's at least sort of a week and a half's notice to schools. But I mean, schools, largely speaking, if, if they are operating either completely or largely, you know, I don't think that is, a, is going to be a a major problem in terms of, of that. And I think having been from a situation where they moved, um, for instance, during the summer to a situation where they, they had not, other than for a very small number of children, um, had not been particularly open to a position where they were fully open, all those schools were able to deliver that really for, for day one um, in towards the end of August in that regard. So I, I think that that, I think the mechanics of that shouldn't be something that would be too difficult in that, in that regard. But in the wider context, uh, the executive has got to take a, 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 as with a range of other things, in the same way as if we take an example, on a completely different example. So, you know, what, what provisions are there for hospitality, uh, hospitality industry? The economy minister will have a key role in that and a key um, view on that. Uh, but it's the executive as a whole will take the decision of what the restrictions are within that. And similarly, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to and can't be in a position where I can simply go on a solo run as regards schools or anywhere else. I will have a views on it. I'll make those views clear to the 
uh, to the executive, but uh, it's not, from that point of view, it's not purely my decision. Thank you, Minister. Minister, uh, I had a query regarding uh, vaccination, but you've already dealt with that there uh, okay. and, and quite, quite, quite some length. But can, can I ask a question? Everybody in this committee is representative of a political party who have an input into the executive. Can we not put pressure on our, 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 our political parties to put pressure on our representatives and the executive to put pressure on the health minister to roll out a vaccination programme for schools? Can we not take that back to our respective parties and fight for that there and make sure that it happens for the benefit of our schools, our teachers and our educational establishments? That's just a rant, but I'll leave it at that. Well, well, I, think, I was asked more questions really for the, the committee members and myself in that regard on it, Morris. Okay. Thanks, Morris. Uh, the lack of physical activity and social interaction has been well highlighted through this committee many, many times. Can I ask the department... Will the department help schools link up with sporting bodies and cross community organisations to help provide summer schemes? Should it be sport, drama, music? It doesn't matter as long as putting children out and getting children active. But this could also be a method of taking pressure off teachers to provide physical activities and interactive activities that allow them to concentrate on educational issues. When no, I work, we work focused on teachers. And could we see a small uptake in programmes promoting summer schemes? and possibly low uptake from other schools in general uh, if we keep putting pressure on teachers to deliver. How can we make sure that there is interaction between schools and sporting bodies and organisations to ensure successful summer activity programmes actually take place? Oh, okay, just uh, on that, I mean, I know that some schools will have direct links. I think, look, I think this comes back to what is happening with the summer. has got to be cross-departmental involving a range of organisations. But I think also where... Uh, and I think, to be fair, this is generally speaking the way that it would be done anyway. In in normal times, if you're having a range of, of summer sports activities, they're quite often not necessarily channeled through the schools. It's about perhaps organisations making that available to children locally to be able to, to sign up to that. And I think that's one of the things that needs to be to be looked at as well. So it, it, there shouldn't be a particular barrier because a pupil goes to a particular school on that basis. But obviously there would be other, some schools will want to be quite proactive themselves as well and, and what they provide. Okay. Okay, Master. Thank you, Chair. I, thanks, Morris. I think, I think Morris is looking for um, facilitated collaboration between community groups and sporting organisations and schools, but maybe that's something we can come back to. Th thanks for those questions, Morris. Okay, Minister, a couple of questions from me. Um, the, there's been widespread dismay at your decision to remove the WJEC qualifications uh, from uh, as an option for teachers and learners in Northern Ireland. What advice did SIA offer you regards your decision to remove WJEC qualifications as an option for teachers and learners in Northern Ireland? Well, as indicated, I think SIA expressed their levels of concern over the, the broad direction of travel um, as well. I don't know, Karen, is anything you want to come in and please? Um, Just so sorry, I'm maybe bringing Karen here as well and then come back to you. Sorry. Yeah. No, Sia would have been talking that from the regulation side, talking to uh, WJC, JEC to find out what the plans were once we'd heard that those were being, um, they were cancelling exams and there was no clarity around what was going to be put in place and our teachers and people here were not involved in that group that was being set up to um, advise what would be in place. So we would have been trying to find out what the options were um, for our students here, you know, whether okay. we were still doing exams and whether that was an option, you know, that they could still offer that. So it was that kind of liaison with them trying to find out, having made their announcement. I mean, I, I suppose from that, that point, you see it, obviously have a role as a regulator as well as, as, uh, as, as well as sort of thing. And I suppose part of that also in terms of the longer term was actually a concern over the direction of travel, which is, appears to be potentially emerging in, in Wales, um, that came, if you like, call it their their version of the, the Deloitte report, um, uh, into that side of things. But uh, as I indicated, we are in a position that, in terms of choices, um, the first time any, any school that this would potentially directly impact on a school would be September 2022. So there is plenty of opportunity. We are keeping in touch, indeed, on the issue under review in that regard. Okay. So if, if there are the level of assurances that can be given in terms of the direction of travel that WJEC 
we go in okay. something which which can be changed in that in that regard. So you you could change your decision. Well, if look if if it becomes clear that that, that they are going to remain something as compatible within the wider. Uh, regulatory framework of of the UK and one that doesn't disadvantage our, our pupils. We have faced this before in, in that, uh, that, as I said, a number of years ago, um, might well have been, I think, under previous minister. It certainly wasn't when well, I was there. What's oh, I? 2017. Oh, sorry, it would have been during the, the period whenever there wasn't. So the, the WJEC GS, GCSEs were taken off the table. Now, okay. it is the case. I think I think the argument, I suppose, is that with, with each of the individual qualifications, there are alternative board qualifications. I suppose the issue is to what extent then necessarily some schools may feel that the WJEC qualification would be the best of those particular okay. elements yep. that set of things. I need the, but there are I, alternatives. Yep. I'm going to have to be rapid, Minister, because of time. Okay, but uh, I, mean, I mean, a lot of the teachers and learners have expressed that they do feel that the WJEC qualifications in a number of subjects does best meet their needs. So what do you have any current contingency plans for the courses that your decision will have removed as an option for teachers and learners? Well, there are contingency plans in the, the, the sense that there are options around a, a range. I think with every subject, there's at least, I think, at least three education boards that offer those. But let, let's remember, anybody who is enrolled in a course now, anybody who will be enrolled uh, on an AS or A level in 2021, anybody who is enrolled in an A2 in 2022, none of those people will be affected. So there's no okay. current learners who are directly affected. Does, does, I, does I ever create more uncertainty, um, uh, uh, an issue for which there is widespread concern in relation to number matters? You mentioned CSA has three rules, as you say, to advise you on uh, curriculum for schools and colleges to develop and award qualifications and to regulate qualifications. Um, is that not a conflict of interest um, as a, and a qualifications provider to have advised you on the removal of these qualifications? Well, look, we always do a level of, of review of, of say that has been the way it's been for quite a long period of time. I suppose the only issue is to what extent, uh, if you were breaking up that role in Northern Ireland, um, you would, uh, you know, there are levels of economies of scale that provided. we're a fairly small jurisdiction in, on that basis on it. But look, I appreciate the point, uh, well, the point okay. that you, you're making. But I mean, look, I think I think they try and give that advice. And I mean, look, it, it, it is the case, for example, in terms of we go back uh, three or four years, that whenever changes which see it implemented um, to the grading system as regards GCSEs were done specifically to ensure that, that broadly speaking, there were choices other than simply a domestic market uh, available in that regard. And there was no, to be fair, there was no resistance from CIA uh, to that, even though arguably you could okay. say if they had a selfish interest, it would have been actually too resistant. Okay. Do you, do you think the Northern Ireland qualifications regulator element of say should be separated and should be independent? Uh, well, look, I, I, I think the regulator performance seems to be done reasonably well. Look, I'm open to any arguments that are put within that. I'm not sure that there's a particular benefit in breaking up uh, that that element of say. And I think, uh, you know, I think there will always be levels of review of, of say that will be ongoing. Um, you know, as indicated, there will be uh, a new an interim, so an interim chief executive will be going into the place. There will be a new, uh, okay. there will be relatively soon a new chair of SEA going in, in the, the place as the, well. The regulation of qualifications in, is independent in England? Well, uh, yeah, but don't forget, England is on the basis that, um, I mean, and first of all, there is a, a broader, uh, there's broader overarching bodies which actually deal with the, uh, certainly England, Scotland and Wales, and was, sorry, England, Wales and Northern Ireland um, in relation to it. I mean, England is in a slightly different position because of both the size of the jurisdiction, but also the fact that, that internally they would have a wide range of, of examination boards. So it would okay. be fairly impossible for somebody to be the provider on that, on that side of it. But uh, the issue around the JCV, which is a joint uh, joint called, JC, yeah, well, anyway, the, the joint... Joint Council for Qualifications. It's okay. Too many J's in the in the joint and on today in that in that regard on it. Okay. For, you know, for arching bit which goes beyond simply the role of, of England, it goes to Wales and Northern okay. as well. So that there okay. is a sort of a wider. Okay. Kind of on it. Okay. Next question, Minister. What, why did you go against Department of Education recommendations to approve a development proposal at Strangford Integrated College that would have seen an increase of a mere twenty places? Um, and did your decision go against your statutory duty? 
uh, to facilitate and encourage integrated education? Well, no, look, I, I, I don't think it's really appropriate to talk about particularly too much in terms of individual um, DPs. The, the detail of that, I think, has been highlighted in terms of the response. No, I don't believe it went against any uh, statutory duty in connection with that. It's noticeable, I think, in that particular case that the education authority itself then at, at final stage indicated they didn't think this was uh, the right development proposal. Uh, and it's also a case that development proposals have all, both legally, while taking into account all relevant factors, have got to be judged entirely on their own uh, merits, which means that that is not simply a question of a DP is put forward and then without thought simply rubber stamped on all, all occasions either. But uh, given that, I, you know, whether or not, as with a number of things, I think there may well end up being um, some level of legal challenge to that. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm loath to probably talk too much about an individual development proposal on that on that basis. Okay. Well, what what was your departmental officials' recommendation? Your fair DEI's recommendations? Well, look, from that point of view, all the documentation is there. I'm not going to get into the uh, the detail of the information that was supplied to me, given the fact, as I said, there may be a challenge to this. Okay, so you you expect you, you expect uh, you expect a legal challenge of your decision in relation to this matter? Frankly, on, on almost anything that that is is done or not done within education, there's nearly always a legal challenge on that basis. So, look, I think um, that remains a a live possibility in that regard. But look, all all sort of um, development proposals from whatever source, from whatever sector, are all treated um, on their merits, and we need to look also both at, at the duties that are there to the wider sector and also what um, are seen across the board to be the, the best delivery uh, for any area. And we need to see probably across the board, which is why we, we look in terms of strategic planning, across the board from all sectors at um, this, uh, at sort of actions which are, are ultimately sort of joined up between sectors as well. I think that, that is a critical bit as we move ahead in terms of area planning. Okay, and is it accurate that the Education Authority is withholding planned growth money from a number of grant-maintained integrated schools? Uh, I'm not, I'm not aware of that. Maybe something, that, um, and look, we can find out directly. Growth money in terms of sorry. Could you could you be a little bit more planned, specific? Planned growth money. Maybe if you're not familiar with it, maybe that's something to to bring forward to you in, in writing or in, in written no, question, I, Minister. Just, I mean, look, I don't know the detail. I know that that the way it works in terms of broader growth money, um, and certainly within in year, and where there's a, a funding bit of where there's a particular level of increase in year, and we've seen this, for example, or even between. You know, so, for example, a number of schools were um, able. We sought funding and got funding into, um, there's an additional cost, for example, if more than anticipated, for instance, stay on after GCSE within a school. But there's a kind of a threshold, I think, that needs to be then met before that. So it's not simply a question of if your numbers unexpectedly increase by a small number that you necessarily get that. But the specifics of that, if you want to write into us, we'll, we'll get a direct answer to that. Okay, okay. Um, you, Scoot, we, we've discussed uh, a children and young people's recovery program um, that needing to cover a wide range of development areas and it need to be cross-departmental. Um, key to that is, is there going to be time and is there going to be resources to do that? And I think that is why it has prompted some organizations like the National Children's Bureau, for example, to, to ask whether the school year um, reset in September has been considered. You said there are a number of practical and educational yeah. reasons why that couldn't happen. Can you give us a short example of what some of those practical and educational reasons are? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll rattle off a few. So from a, a practical point of view, if, for example, I'm working on the assumption that those, for instance, coming from preschool and nursery would still want to be going into P1, you would effectively, if there was a complete restart of all years, you would have effectively 15 years worth of, of study as opposed to 14 years. That has major implications, for instance, again, if we're doing this across the board for transfer into post-primary schools, it has major implications in terms of the uh, role of FE and HE. From a practical point of view, that if you simply are restarting for everybody, you're adding in another roughly, what, 23,000 students into the system. From the pure cost point of view, that is likely to run into tens of millions. If you're taking, say, on the primary school side of it, uh, a scenario where there are additional children coming in through the nursery side, 
but you are, if you like, redoing P7, for example, you're then from a physical point of view trying to accommodate eight years where normally there would be seven. The physical infrastructure that would be needed for a lot of schools, both the cost of providing additional infrastructure, but the ability for a lot of schools that are at times, most schools would be in a situation, a lot of schools would be in a situation where the number of classrooms, particularly at primary level, matches, if you like, the number of pupils that, that are there. You know, defined an extra two or three classrooms effectively from a schooling point of view. From the academic point of view, there has been, the position is at present, there's a small number of, roughly speaking, um, there are two groups of, of pupils, or two sets of pupils, roughly about 5,000 within the system are over age. Most of those are on the basis of over age because of particular SEN issues, or are newcomer children who you know, may well, for instance, have issues around, around language. But from a, a, an educational point of view, there has been done, um, sorry, if you just give me a second or two here. Yeah. Uh, with Minister, just, just, just while yeah, yeah, no, yeah, no, you, yeah, just while you're, you're looking for that, could I, could yeah. I ask, I mean, could, ha, have you scoped the possibility of transferring transition years like year 14 onto uh, further and higher education, year seven onto post-primary? Um, and looking at this as an opportunity to address our um, outlier early school start age and create a, a second reception or preschool year. Have any of those types of again, again, ideas you're been still, scoped? You're still, you're still creating a situation where you have a certain level of bottleneck within the system. In terms of repeat, and what I was going to say just in terms of that, this is an international studies that have been there. For those who are, are repeating, the Education Endowment Foundation has looked at, at international evidence actually over, over a long period of time, both in Europe, North America, They've looked at what has happened locally. What has been found, statistics show greater negative effects for students from disadvantaged backgrounds, but particularly for those who, if you're repeating a year academically, uh, those students are more likely to drop out of school. On average, they're, that even with the additional year, because you know, does that mean effectively somebody repeating a year then has to skip a year to, at a further point in relation to that? Um, and... Uh, the academic studies would suggest that from a, an academic attainment point of view, that it actually then, on average, uh, means a sort of a, a damage of about four months worth of, of education okay. uh, within that. So the, the education arguments don't particularly stack up. Now, okay. there is the opportunity for an individual parent to make their case, and boards of governors have got flexibility and a small number of cases for an individual to do that. But in general, the advice seems to be from, from all educational experts that this is not, in general, something which is a benefit uh, to students themselves, leaving aside the massive level, indeed, even from that point of view, uh, to make changes on second reception years, you would need changes in primary legislation uh, on that basis, which would simply not be something that could be done for this September anyway. But there's a whole range of financial, practical... OK, and it, it's OK. And maybe, it, I think Janice, Janice, I know, has got uh, considerable background in this. Uh, given, the fact, given the fact that all the officials have not had a chance to speak as yet... <laughs> I'd love to hear from Janice. Love to hear from Janice. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, thanks. Okay, so yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of soap and fun, um around the idea of the new year, and the minister has already outlined a whole raft of reasons, but I suppose educationally, when you look at international research and local research, there's no concrete evidence base that would suggest that it would be in the best educational interests of all children to repeat their educational year in a wholesale type approach. That's not to say that for some individual children it might be the right thing to do. Um, currently, that can happen anyway. So if a decision is taken um, for an individual child to repeat the year, that's done with those who know the child best. So it would be the principal of the school, the board of governors ultimately would make the decision in conjunction with the parents and if that child has an edu a special educational needs statement, it would be done in regards with the EA as well. So um, we have looked across the board at all of the educational evidence, um, and, and there's nothing there that suggests that this would be in the best educational interest of all children. Okay. Um, in terms of, as the Minister has already said, perhaps to point out, just some of that evidence would suggest that it could potentially have a negative effect. And I don't think the risk that we could take that children okay. can look even further in their education by taking a wholesale approach. 
Okay, I, I presume, I, I, I presume, I, sorry, Minister Abrath, I presume none of that research has ever been conducted on the basis of a, a global pandemic that has disrupted up to six months learning of entire year cohorts. But I, I appreciate the response um, on that matter so far. What that does suggest, however, if that is the, the firm view of the department, as a number of members are consistently alluding to here, that means a, a children and young people's recovery program focusing on academic, social, emotional, physical well-being is absolutely paramount with adequate resources invested in it and an understanding of what that impact of the disruption to learning has been. And I think we need further reassurance as to exactly what that program is going to look like and exactly how much additional funding is going to be given to our schools and our teachers to do the difficult job that they are ready to do um, ahead, Minister? No, look, I, I, Chair, I don't, don't disagree. A final point you should make in terms of the, the restart bit is, even if you smooth over the transition stuff, if you take, for example, somebody in year nine repeating the year, then either they're going to be in a situation where at a future point they either skip a year in relation to it or more likely end up doing for that particular individual, 15 years in school. So it does have, it does have major implications. In terms of that, no, I, look, I think there needs to be a level of, of support. Uh, look, it is clear that, that given where budgets are, the route in which there can be finance of this will come through the executive through COVID. That requires the executive to sign off on a programme on that basis. I think there is scope for levels of support that are there. The indications at present are that, that this year, there has been very, very large amounts of money being supplied centrally to the Northern Ireland Executive in relation to COVID. What is likely to happen next year is that there will be still considerable amounts of money, but there will be a fraction of what's there in 2021. So that will create some level of limitation uh, within what, what can be got. But clearly, again, maybe to take Morris's uh, position, if members of the committee are, uh, are able to lobby uh, their colleagues in relation to levels of financial support that would be there, that would be something I'm sure that, that okay. all of us would be would very much welcome. Kate, I, I recognise your time as Minister. Any final comment you'd like to make in relation to the examination series and the, the alternative arrangements that, that lie ahead? Obviously, we've got SIA up next, and we'll go into a bit more detail in that regard, but would you like to take any opportunity to make a final well, comment think, on that matter? I think from that point of view, things, things are progressing um, in relation to that, but probably in terms of the detail, you know, I'm happy for, to leave it. So, I mean, I appreciate there's other business that the... Um, that the committee will want to be getting on with. So, I'm, you know, I don't have any final final parting shot, so to speak. Okay, Minister, thank you for your time today. Ho hopefully you'll be um, with us on a fairly regular basis in the coming weeks and months, given the scale of the issues ahead in education. Thank you. Okay, members, can I bring in the clerk briefly at that point, just to um, advise of any further actions? Yeah. Um, so the committee will want to uh, follow up with the department on a, a number of matters, um, namely, um, and you, you can add to this, this is probably not comprehensive, what is the department doing in concert with health and communities ministers to ensure already disadvantaged pupils are not left behind academically? Um, the committee is welcoming the engaged strategy being rolled out in special needs schools in respect, sorry? Right about Keep going the line. Daniel, Daniel, we're 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 all back in spotlight and, and unmuted just to make sure people are aware of that. And um, I think Clark, um, you were mentioning about uh, engaged program for special schools. Perhaps you were going to suggest adding uh, preschool to that as well. But let you come back in there. Um. Okay. I, I, it's further down, but. Um, no problem. Okay. So, in respect of um, YJEC, the, the Welsh Board, um, what is being done to ensure that students in Northern Ireland are not being offered a reduced selection of A-levels when compared to their peers in other jurisdictions, um, and urging the Minister to change his decision? It sounded like there was um, potential for that to happen just now. Um, then also, um, the committee would be interested to know what the Minister is doing to ensure that any grading process introduced for A-levels this summer would be compatible with the entry requirements of the English, Irish, Scot Scottish and Welsh universities. Um, in terms of the um, recharge uh, or recovery programme, um, uh, Justin certainly was looking for more information about that, how it's being coordinated 
what bids have the department made to the finance minister to provide such a program? Um, how can the uh, COVID money um, secured in the 21-22 financial package reflect the needs of pupils um, to heal and recover emotionally and socially before returning to learning? Um, and then after the discussion of repeating the academic year, um, uh, I think it was the chair said that you know really the recovery a recovery program like that is absolutely imperative. Um, in terms of the uh, vaccination then in special schools, um, the committee was concerned about how realistic it is to have a two tier approach to vaccination in special schools. Um, again, then coming back to uh, the other pandemic of mental health, um, the. Committee was interested in knowing the timings for uh, the department's paper to the executive um, on a recovery program and um, in, in sharing proposals about mental health and suicide awareness, um, how mental health champion and youth organisations will be uh, involved in that. Some of that will recap what we the committee wrote about last week. Um, so the minister is going to get back to the committee on student teacher placements um, working, um, with the economy department to get an answer um, for completeness. Um, the committee was interested in knowing if the Engage programme is not sufficiently tailored to the needs of nursery and preschool pupils, what additional support and resource the department is directing towards pupils impoverished by social and play restrictions. Um, and moving on to uh, CCEA, um, I think we would like to, the, the department to rehearse um, in terms of comparative governance um, and good practice. Um, you know, whether there's a conflict of interest between the various roles of CCEA um, as qualifications provider and also regulator. Um, perhaps the regulator element should be independent as in England. Um, and then there were a couple of uh, specific questions about um, integrated schools uh, development proposal and some withholding of planned growth. Um, does okay. that sound like members? Yes, yeah, members, anything to add to that? Sure, could I come in? Yes, Pat, yeah. go ahead, Pat, and then Daniel. Pat, yeah, first. Sure, just, just uh, in, in relation to an issue that wasn't raised, I was trying to get on at the, at the end there, but I appreciate oh. the time. Um, in regard to Irish medium education, there are particular difficulties for pupils in particular whose parents don't speak the language. Now, my own two daughters are at Irish medium, but I do speak Irish, so I'm able to help them with their schoolwork. But others uh, have, have a difficulty if their parents don't. But it's also a problem shared by newcomer children whose parents maybe don't have English as a first language and who aren't able to assist their children in, in, in the way that they would like to. So it would be interesting to hear what additional support the Minister is providing or what special measures he's putting in place in that regard. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Pat. Daniel, did you want to come in as well? Um, Chair, thanks very much. Uh, I'm not overly impressed by some of the answers that the Minister gave today, but I don't think I've ever stated I've been impressed with very much this Minister has done to date. Just um, in relation to uh, two, two, two things, uh, in relation to uh, the powers, the COVID powers that, that we referenced, the, the Children's Law Centre clearly cited the power that is there uh, at the Minister's disposal that he, that he could use. Um, so, as, as, you know, as he's saying, basically, that, that advice is wrong. Uh, I, I don't believe the Minister has been honest with us. Either he isn't accepting that he has this power available to him or he's misleading us all that he just doesn't want to use it. But uh, like, th this is a, a really uh, sticky point for me. I, I, I just don't think he's doing enough to protect children in that instance, and, and that it's of great concern. COVID powers are there. They've shut down our entire society, and this minister can certainly use them uh, to put procedures in place that ensure fairness for children uh, in, in school at this time. But you know, that, that's one yeah. of the things. Yeah, I'm I, I content, content for us to write to the Minister and ask him why he has not used his powers under the Coronavirus Act to direct a, a common um, contingency criteria for admissions to post-primary schools this year that would have been in line with recommended criteria rather than non-recommended criteria, if yeah. members are content with that. 
And it, 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 a, slight, a slight issue with that, sir. Um, okay, think, go ahead, Robbie. That, that will determine that the, the committee's position is that it had to be recommended criteria in an, in an, in an uh, a unique scenario, which I disagree with, actually. I mean, I spoke to the Children's Law Centre, and that, I have to be clear about this. They uh, are not advocating that it had to be down to the, de the department's recommended criteria. What, what, if you're going to draw up a first set of criteria in an unusual circumstance, people in this committee need to absolutely accept that actually a set of criteria which are unusual might be acceptable. And the difficulty is, <clears throat> whatever the response is from the Minister and the Children's Law Centre in this, Every one of us is going to have some difficulties. We have some sympathy with the minister that uh, some people perhaps are looking uh, at one side of this and, and, and maybe neglecting that they have to move on it. Um, and okay. for a front out, I'm not, not wholly sure about that. that okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 This is the old no, let me respond to, to Robbie. Um, Robbie, I, I suppose the, the point being is, uh, is it not better um, in the absence of your your type of criteria, you would have preferred that, um, that the criteria that is being used is recommended rather than non-recommended. However, we're all capable as individual members to continue to raise this issue. So if, if you're not content with that, I have no intention of, of using time on that matter because we've got a heck of a lot of else to get through. So you prefer we didn't submit that correspondence, Robbie? Yeah, but yeah, unless you reword it and take out that you're directing the education committee's position is on recommended criteria. That that's okay. No well, three eleven BCSEs. No, but there is Department of Education recommended criteria on post primary transfer. Okay, we're not going to get agreement on this, Daniel. You content to take that one forward yourself and bring you back in again there? Yeah, chair, but. You know, it's, it's the department's own criteria, but anyway, yeah, so I, I agree. I agree. Okay. Not, not built, does it say anywhere that it was built for contingencies like this, like a pandemic? It doesn't. It says it was built for all schools for post primary admissions. Um, but yeah. let, let's move on. Okay, Daniel. Yeah, Chair, just a final point. I think it's important, moving on from that subject, I think it's important also that the committee request that Sarah Long come before uh, the committee to give evidence and an update in particular on. Uh, uh, SEN uh, and uh, uh, the placement of children in particular. Uh, I, I think that uh, we're, we're headed for some difficult ground this year again on, on this particular issue and it would be good to get ahead of the ball uh, and request that they're along again committee if everyone's agreeable. Yeah, Clark, uh, do we know when the Education Authority are next scheduled to be with us? They, they, were, they were scheduled but have, um, have rescheduled, is that right? They have. Sorry, bear with me. Um, yeah, we don't have we don't have a date for them just now, actually. Okay. Um, They're coming on the fourteenth of April about the one project. Okay, I think I think there's some space in the twenty fourth of March there as well. So um, welcome them on the one project on the fourteenth of April, but perhaps we'd. Um, invite them, um, as da as per Daniel's suggesting there, on um, wider special educational needs review issues on the 24th of March, if there's space. Um, we can look at that. Okay. okay. Members, yes. any, any other members wish to come in? I need to, I need to get to see in here quickly. Content? With all those suggestions, yeah. Content. Okay, agreed. Thank you. Okay, members, then we'll move to uh, agenda item six, uh, our briefing from SIA on examinations 2021. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members from the spotlight and to add our witnesses? Can I remind members uh, of a briefing note from the committee clerk at page 50? SIA response regarding the Deloitte Independent Review of last year's examinations at page 52. A copy of the Deloitte Review at page 67, a copy of the Minister's statement to the Assembly regarding alternative awarding arrangements for SEA qualifications in summer 2021 at page 16, and welcome Justin Edwards, Chief Executive of SEA, and Esther Martin, Business Manager, Curriculum and Assessment at SEA, and Amanda Swan, Business Manager, Qualification at SEA. Can I advise witnesses the committee will do our best to give you five to ten minutes for your statement, followed by sh very short questions now at this stage. Um, apologies for that, and over to you, Justin. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and uh, 
Good, mo good morning to the committee and thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. I'll keep my uh, statement short because I'm sure the committee will want to get into questioning. Um, first of all, you mentioned that uh, the committee wished to look at the uh, Deloitte review and um, certainly Tia notes that the Department of Education did publish the independent report on the review and it's on the department's website and that was into the 2020 summer GCSE, AS and A-level examinations. The review was carried out by Deloitte over a six-week period in the autumn, and they analyze um, methodology, design, implementation, management, and communication of the arrangements. I think that uh, in the report, which the committee will have read, um, it, it from the outset recognizes that CIA's job was extremely challenging. Um, but that working between CIA's council and the Department of Education, we did adopt a professional approach to the unprecedented task in, at hand. Uh, examinations had not been cancelled for as far as records could show um, previously. The report does acknowledge that without examinations, it was always going to be extremely difficult to find uh, a balance of maintaining standards and arriving at great outcomes. Certainly those that would be accepted as fair by all teachers, parents and candidates. And in fact, the report states that there was no perfect solution and that the conclusion was that no alternative approaches identified by CIA and approved by the department um, were, uh, were perfect in that regard. And it involved moving forward on a, on a least worst option basis. The report also noted that CIA's uh, determination and, and, and dedication uh, to provide an approach which would include fairness, reducing burden, future impact limitation, minimizing uncertainty, standardization, and also um, a statutory requirement placed on CIA uh, to ensure that it had alignment across UK jurisdictions. Um, whilst it recognised positive factors, uh, it also outlined a number of learnings from the process. Um, for example, it outlined that we need to continually review and change the design uh, of decisions, that the provision of guidance and support um, on moderation uh, may have been helpful, um, that formal risk assessment, the options at the design phase, um, would have been uh, helpful and that more clarification on standardization uh, would also assist the public. They also recognize that the appeals process, um, particularly challenging in this circumstances and consideration needs to be given uh, to the appeals process in, in future years. It did state that while more early and regular engagement with stakeholders uh, would be recommended, um, it was acknowledged that the time constraints that CO was under, under we did attempt to carry out constructive dialogue with uh, key stakeholders in developing the solutions. We, uh, we welcome the report and as I have sent in advance to the committee, we've highlighted the key concerns with inside the report and also considered our actions, both actions that we are currently taking or actions that we have taken to address the matters or areas of learning uh, from the report and particularly in design and consideration of the 2021 summer arrangements, which the minister has uh, outlined and announced. Um, we are a learning organization. Um, we always find uh, learning from such reports uh, helpful to us, and certainly council and the department will keep under review CS progress against those matters of learning. Of course, now that the minister has um, formally canceled the examinations, and set out the arrangements, uh, the alternative award arrangements in summer 2021. Our focus is on providing those alternative arrangements. In terms of those alternative arrangements, I have provided the committee uh, some uh, briefing documents which sets out the steps for the arrangements. These are the high level steps that align with the minister's statement. SIA is currently uh, rapidly working through to finalize the advice to centers, which is the technical advice to centers which will hold the detail underneath uh, of the sentence approach. But we've also been in engagement with those centres, those are schools and colleges across Northern Ireland in terms of supporting those steps and the next steps in the process. So hopefully for the committee, that presents an, an overview. Uh, I'm happy to take questions, Chair. Thank you, Justin. Can I bring in Deputy Chairperson Pat Chain, MLA? Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, Justin, for that presentation. Justin, in the chamber uh, during the week, the uh, it may have been last week, sorry, the the minister said that an algorithm, and you'll remember the controversy over the algorithm, the use of the algorithm last year, uh, in, in terms of making assessments. The minister has said that this year an algorithm will still be used 
in order to standardise results uh, in comparison with previous years. Could you explain to the committee uh, a bit more about that, please? Thanks. Certainly, Pat. My understanding was that um, an algorithm will not be used, and SIA has been very clear no algorithm will be used in the standardization process of the summer 2021 awarding process. So it'll be categorical that uh, an algorithm will not be used in this new arrangement. So the minister was wrong in that information he gave to the assembly? I don't know what the minister's statement was precisely, but that is my understanding that an algorithm will not be used. Okay, thanks for that. And just in terms of the Deloitte report, uh, it, it highlighted the lack of transparency and poor communication last year. Tell me, what are SIA doing this year to ensure that doesn't uh, happen again? I think in regards to the communication, there were a number of factors in the Deloitte report where communication was strong. Um, there was clear um, videos, guidance, including sign language videos for young people and, and information. There were specific factors in the communication um, the report highlighted that it felt we could have set out, for example, the use of ranks versus grades in the process at an earlier phase of engaging principals, and also that we could have raised awareness that standardization is a normal process of any examination system uh, more in advance. Certainly from CS perspective, we've taken those lessons on board and have engaged those uh, engaged those with um, the process this year, and we've started communication strategy early. Um, we have a little bit more time this year, maybe not a lot, but a little bit more time and started that communication strategy early so that centres, particularly um, principals and, and heads of schools and colleges, have an understanding of how standardisation will take place this year. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that, Chair. Thanks, Pat. Robin Newton, MLA. And, uh, it is my understanding that the Minister said that the algorithm will not be used, that's my understanding. Uh, can I just ask uh, and thank uh, uh, CCEA for, for coming. Um, one question um, really around the design and the alternative awarding arrangements. Um, obviously, it's, it's important, Justin, that all pupil students have confidence in 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 what is being uh, implemented. Uh, could you just comment on the design decisions and the the indication that they are continually reviewed and challenged as their implementation actually progresses? Thank you for the question. Um, and certainly, yes, it was our understanding that an algorithm would not, not be used and we will not use uh, an algorithm in this process to walk through the steps of the process and give uh, confidence of those steps and how they build confidence. In the first step, we are working with centres to Im improve centre readiness for this process. Last year, we had limited time uh, in which to get centres ready because of the nature and the timing of the decision in March. This year, we have a little more time. So, for example, not only are we producing information and guidance for centres and young people, but we are also um, are running training for centres. We are partnered with the Chartered Institute of Examination Assessors, uh, which operates at the University of Huddersfield, um, which is a professional body and collective body that will then bolster or support um, all schools. Um, over 200 schools have already started, have signed up, and on the 22nd of February, that training will, will under, go underway. So the, the training is building up uh, understanding or reinforcing understanding that already takes place. In the second step, we then work with centres as they gather a range of evidence. We know that COVID has been highly disruptive um, to young people uh, and, and learners in terms of being able to produce evidence from assessment. So we're going to have to work with centres as they gather a range of evidence on which to base judgments and their outcomes. We'll also be providing to centres an assessment resource. This shouldn't be the only part of evidence that is used, but it is effectively us repurposing the 2020 and 2021 examination components uh, into new items that haven't been seen before, along with mark schemes and then subject guidance to support training. This is a this is a um, providing instruments to teachers so that teachers can then make judgments or use it. It's optional; they do not have to use it if they don't wish, but it is there if they do wish to use it. We then enter the moderation phase, and we will be working with centres 
uh, as they develop their policies for internal moderation. Some centres last year clearly had very, very um, detailed and uh, stringent internal moderation processes. So it's keen for us to share with the sector uh, how they take this forward. There is a factor of professional trust, but that professional trust is kept within inside the centre at this internal moderation phase. And then in step four, SEER will review evidence. And in this regard, we will ask for a sample of student work because all these judgments need to come back to student work and the evidence provided in that and carry out uh, a review of that um, against the, the specification and against the policy which the school is operating. Certainly then, beyond that, we're into the issue of results. Uh, and then the issue of results, as Minister outlined, would be no later than the date he's currently stepped, but he's also set out that he is uh, monitoring the potential change in position in England, which hasn't set out its issue of results date yet. So there are many layers. Um, to provide confidence, and there are many stages, both external and internal to the centres, but also bolstered, taking the opportunity to bolster it with training and support. Um, thank you for that very detailed answer. Can I just pick up on a word that there are two words that you used, uh, professional trust, and then tie that in where perhaps a centre is... Uh, but where a centre is found maybe not to be compliant uh, with the standards and how quickly you can react in that situation to put things right? I think it's um, there, there are three key processes in professional in the professional judgment point of view. The first part is that the teacher has to make a judgment against the standard or the specification. We will provide subject specific guidance and advice. And a lot of the practicing teachers out there are also assessors. They don't just work for SEER, they work for other examining bodies, but they do operate in this. And so they do have a good understanding of the standard required. The second phase is then challenged by the sender internally, um, teacher looking at other teachers' operational work through the process, process or, or policy. Again, we'll be supporting senders mainly through um, CIEA training, but also other information and guidance. So there is challenge there at that point. And as you say, then once centres submit grade, it's an opportunity for SEER to take a look at that data. And we will look, we will use June to look at that data. And we will return to centres where we believe um, there may be issues, and that will be from a broad range of information. So it won't just be about outcomes, but maybe it'll be about policy or application of policy. Um, so that we can have a professional dialogue with centres where we think that they may need to consider the um, grades they've already awarded. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Justin. Thanks, Robin. Daniel McCrossan, MLA. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Justin. Uh, good to see you uh, this morning. Um, Justin, I just want to start off. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question that has been born me. I'm just wondering, why is SIA providing schools with data packs with historical data for 2017 to 2019 when the Minister has clearly stated in the Assembly and at this committee that historical data will play absolutely no role in schools' determination of grades this year? Which, you know, can you explain that to me? Well, we haven't provided any data, uh, data packs yet, uh, Daniel, um, to any centre. What we felt that we should do is, like the assessment resources, is provide what information SIA has to the centre so that the centre can make, um, uh, make its own judgments about how to use that information in its processes, make informed judgments about what the value of that information is in regards to their own processes. So if we're providing anything, we're providing the broad range of evidence that we have to actually support centres in making judgments, nothing more. You know, the, the information, so, so you're saying that you haven't provided data packs uh, with historical data for 17 to 19? No. Just no. I've received today would suggest otherwise, but uh, we'll come back to that. Thank you for your clarification, uh, because if we did, if, if that was to happen, uh, we'd be facing a very serious situation that's... Uh, as bad as, if not worse, uh, than last year. Well, uh, Daniel, so, sorry, um, uh, maybe you would like to outline the severity of why SEA wouldn't provide all the information it holds to centres so that they can make informed judgments. I, I, I feel that from a, a SEA perspective, it would be very important that we would give centres information that we have that would help them. Yeah, but uh, specifically, the Minister has said in public record that he wouldn't use historical data um, uh, and... and the information I've got today is that the data packs 
uh, it has been provided, or that there's data backs been provided for for seventeen to nineteen, um, even though the minister stated that that wouldn't be the case. Well, clearly, Danny, you're getting information from sources where you know at this point in time we haven't released information. If we do release yeah. information, it's only on the basis of a supporting senders. If we release prior performance information, it's only because we have it and we can give it to senders if they wish to use it. It is not a it is not a point that we are saying here's information on prior performance, you must align to this. Um, it is for us to provide information to send us to support them through this process. Okay, th thank you, Justin, for the clarification. Uh, Deloitte recommended the application of a weighting system to the principles underpinning design of alternative awards to reflect uh, relative importance. Your view is that the principle, uh, principles maintain equal uh, weighting. It strikes me that Deloitte would have uh, made that recommendation had would not have made that recommendation had they have not seen a need for uh, relativity. Uh, why and by what process, Justin, did you arrive at your conclusion of equality? And do you think that CA's decision remains the Deloitte recommendation? The decisions on equality are matters for screening under uh, equality factors, so that is a separate process. Um, all options that we present, we do consider in terms of screening and for equality compatibility uh, in, in taking forward before we present that advice finally to the department for consideration by the minister. Um, separate from that, the principles were, if you like, broad governing principles um, on which then council could understand the impact of any decision in regards to each of those principles. So for example, fairness versus impact um, limitation. Um, you may have a very fair system in year, but does that have impact limitations for future years? So really, um, in terms of uh, the weighting, it was um, a factor of understanding and discussing the principles um, overall um, before providing that advice and before considering all the risks associated with that advice. Okay, th thank you, Just. Uh, I notice your action plan in response to the Deloitte review states that um, the time available in 2021 is not uh, considerably more than in 2020. Considering how little time C had in 2020 and the problems this created for yourselves, Justin, and later schools, I'm fearful for this year as well, and I've clearly stated that on public record a number of times. As you look at the time left between now and the end of May, when schools have to send their centre to determine grades to say, I don't know how everything can be done with the required degree of robustness. I fear that once again, teachers and schools have been, through no fault of their own, placed in a, an impossible position. Uh, given that, what problems do you envisage SEA and schools will be facing this year? Uh, following that, has uh, the lack of time uh, not the potential to impinge on a robust system for awarding fair grades being put in place? And finally, Justin, is there anything further uh, that could be done to aid SEA in schools at this time? So three three points in drilling. The, the time available is very tight. Um, the time in a normal year would be very tight. The um, substantial change to any examination system, should we not be in a pandemic, would usually take place over a much more elongated period of time. But the time we have available is the time we have available. Um, it is the desire to get young people outcomes and grades which they deserve so that they can progress into the next stage of employment. So we have to work on that timeline and get awards um, for those young people by August. Working back from that, um, it is being our assessment that the best way to use the time available is to support centres, to get centres ready, to provide training. And I mentioned that to a previous uh, question but also to use uh, the time um, intervening and protect the time intervening so that centres are able to gather the evidence. It is a ask of the system, but as was demonstrated last year, the education system did step up to the ask even under a more compressed time frame. I do think that it will be important to retain the time um, to an August issue of results, if at all possible, on the basis that the review phase and also the internal moderation phase has the maximum time available. I also note that um, it will be increasingly challenging for schools to gather evidence um, should they remain closed and, and working remotely. But again, we'll just have to work with the system uh, in order to gather that evidence and make assessment judgments against it. Um, so there are, there are risks associated with the time, but it is for us to communicate and work with the wider education system and actually work collectively to get this done in the interest of young people. Okay, Justin, and final point, Chair, if you'll indulge me again, just in relation to Deloitte. Deloitte pointed out there was a lack of statistical expertise on the council to enable it to exercise its challenge function. Uh, while your answer points out 
that it is for the CA Council to identify deficit in knowledge, skills, and understanding. Your answer does not state what Council intends to do in this instance. So, based on that, Justin, does the Council not think that a recommendation of this nature from Deloitte requires a more positive response than the one that has been, that has been given? And secondly, considering the challenges COVID 19 is presenting to us all, would it not be prudent for the Council to, to co opt a suitably qualified and experienced person as soon as possible? Um, Daniel, I'm not a council member and the chief executive, and I operate under the direction of the, the, the council who remains my employer. Um, in regards to their skills needs, if they have a skills deficit or a skills requirement, council will identify that, and it's for me as officers to go and seek that. If they wish to take that on board, then, then so be it. Um, this action plan was written at a time um, when uh, the report came out, so it's from a SEA operational uh, executive perspective. But certainly it's for council to consider that and i'm sure council will consider that i've worked with the council over six years and i know that they always um do ask the question do they need further skills and they may reflect on that and just as a point of assurance reassurance uh, deloitte has also made a number of recommendations in relation to the appeal process justin uh, they suggested that all appeals should be free well, can, can you confirm if this will be the case and, and daniel that's, that's going to be the last point by the way thank you justin uh, at the moment in time, uh, the Minister has set out the, the broad positions on appeals. We will have to work through appeals with providers. Uh, we will, as part of that, consider the fees charges as well as we did last year, and we'll consider the impact on that uh, overall. Um, that will be part of the wider uh, appeals process, which we will issue in due course. I'm not at liberty at the moment to say that it will for certainty be free, but it would certainly take on board the recommendation of Deloitte. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Daniel. Justin, why, why are the council not here today? Um, I, I believe you've invited me, Chris. <laughs> and I, I, I made no attendance, but very, certainly... Very, very glad to have the, the representatives that are here today, but I think on previous occasions the council have proactively attended themselves, um, so maybe that's a, an oversight on all our parts, given some of these questions clearly do pertain to the council. I'll move on swiftly, given our timings, and bring in Robbie Butler, MLA. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Justin. Um, as you've said, you're the Chief Executive of CCEA at the moment, but I did read an article uh, during the week, Justin, that um, you may not be with us much longer. Um, I'm just going to put it on record that I want to thank you for uh, the leadership. Uh, I hope I'm not forestall on anything that you've given. Uh, on a personal level, I think you've done your very best in very difficult circumstances. Um, and if you do go, uh, and when you do, I personally will miss uh, you as the CEO of CCEA. Um, that notwithstanding, obviously, last year was an incredibly difficult year, and, and the fallout uh, and the impact of that, most people felt, but none more so than uh, those pupils who uh, became very anxious and, and so on about the length of time um, that they had to wait for answers, and then obviously with the, the national debacle of, of the, the algorithm. Um, given that, Justin, and given what we have learned from that, uh, what, and now I haven't had time to have oversight of the Deloitte report, um, if you were to truncate uh, as CEO and, and, and maybe give us three or four concise points that will give us confidence that lessons have been learned uh, and what CCA have done to ensure that, that there isn't a repeat and, and this year is, is much, much better. Um, uh, thank you for your kind words at the start. Um, certainly uh, from a high level viewpoint, obviously the public acceptability of the algorithm is outlined by Deloitte and as I've outlined from the start of this uh, session, uh, say we're not using algorithm uh, in the stages. Uh, the report also makes recommendation of moderation uh, and moderation component while recognises we were under um, extreme time pressures to introduce moderation in the previous years. We have taken that on board and as I've outlined in the step three of the process there is an internal moderation and in step four a review process so we have considered, considered that factor. Um, the report's also outlined um, the challenges with um, the public awareness of standardization, that standardization was part of examinations, and we do have to consider that as part of our communication package as we go through these steps um, to ensure that learners and, and senders understand that standardization is part of a, a normal a normal qualification series, I wouldn't say examination series, but a qualification series. And then also uh, that we need to consider the flexibilities in terms of, of evidence uh, as we generate this. So I, I suppose those are the high level takeaways from the report. Brilliant. Um, okay. Uh, the, the next one would be that um, uh, there seems to have been a, a, a reasonably widespread uh, welcome of the, the, the 
matters they're going to be partaking to, to, to this year's A levels and GCSEs from both students, student rep bodies. I'd be interested to 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 know what engagement there's been and consultation with unions and rep bodies at that level because one of the things that seemed to be certainly bandied about last year and uh, was lack of consultation, lack of teacher buy-in and, and, and sector involvement. Um, would that have been picked up this year, Justin? And, and is there anything that you can share with us today that would indicate that that is where, where we are? I think that the report highlights that in the time constraints that CIA had, it was really difficult to do broad uh, a range of key hold, stakeholder engagement. Um, it, it recognizes that we did have key stakeholder engagement uh, at that point uh, in time where we possibly could, but that all a further engagement may have supported the process. Um, throughout this year, and in fact, since May of last year, we've engaged actively with uh, principal um, bodies, um, trade unions, teacher trade unions, uh, and also um, representative bodies. Uh, we've also continued to engage with the um, Young Persons uh, panel uh, from the Northern Ireland um, Joint Young Persons Commissioner um, to set out changes that have been made, but also to take feedback um, in regards to the processes and changes that we are considering. Um, so throughout these phases, we've always sought feedback and engagement um, throughout. Um, I recognise that the, the approach is, is widely uh, accepted, but um, as per previous years, each step will need monitored very carefully and mm -hmm. reviewed. Uh, as we progress through it and, and continuous engagement will, will happen throughout this process. Brilliant. Okay. So the final point, sir, that, that, I think that point there, is there then, that the one point that you raised last is very important, is there sufficient flex and agility to um, tweak this as we as we move forward to the end end of the process? Secondly, um, could you, uh, I'm not sure if this is a fair question to ask you. You probably say you should ask the minister. In terms of ministerial direction for this year, could you uh, highlight any specific ministerial direction given to CCA in this? And lastly, and this is slightly left the field, uh, there are a number of students who uh, will sit through centres and they're being privately tutored. Um, I think they missed out last year. So if you could um, tell us what's happening with those students who are being not through schools but through centres and privately tutored to sit GCSE and A-levels this year. I'm picking up with your three points on the first one in terms of flexibility to the process in year. Um, there is limited flexibility, I think it would be fair to say, and there are two reasons for this. First of all, um, any flexibility or change will create further uncertainty for young people. Okay. Um, and I would be cautious of that. Um, young people need to one will want to know how the evidence is gathered, how grades will be assigned, how they will receive grades. And if there is a change to that process, as I said, create uncertainty and, and, and possibly stress. But sometimes change is um, necessary because of maybe time constraints. And if there's one thing that maybe the pandemic has taught me, you don't know what happens next in regard to the pandemic. So you have to make decisions uh, then in regards to that. I think in the, um, so your, your, your third point was on um, private tuition, um, I believe, yes. and certainly, um, the centre is the is the grading centre. It's the school or college which awards the grade. It is for the centre to decide what evidence is relevant um, in terms, and we will give guidance and information on that uh, on that information. But it is for the centre to decide from the guidance and information we provide how to gather that evidence. And um, yeah. in all cases, that evidence should relate back to um, evidence that teachers or schools have confidence in in terms of awarding the, the grade. I missed your second point again, if you wouldn't mind repeating. Yeah, so it was to do with any ministerial direction with regard to maybe the Deloitte report and, and what has been crafted for, for this cohort of GCSE and A level. So, because I know that was, we were asked last year, we used to ask you regularly, what was the ministerial direction on this? And I think it's it's, it's just fair to be as transparent as possible in terms of any ministerial direction to where we are with CCA's uh, ideas here. Yeah, uh, s certainly um, our. Uh, from following the receipt of the report, we've obviously considered the report in any advice we've given. And as I outlined it to a, a previous question, we obviously keep it under review. And as we are introducing the changes, we are going back to the report and the recommendations of that report. The department will also keep under review and see a council will keep under review operational matters uh, in terms of addressing that report. At this point, um, I have not received the formal direction from the minister as to how to proceed. Obviously, the minister has made this statement. I think the minister outlined in his session this morning that this legal considerations um, but we expect that and as soon as we have that then we can we can proceed with the advice and information directly afterwards justin thank you and god bless you Cheers. thanks, thanks robbie uh, members it's my understanding that our, our broadcasting of our session will cease at 12 o'clock um I, I do understand we can continue to ask questions
questions and um, receive answers from Shay. Justin, before we lose broadcasting, can I ask if you did engage with or advise the minister in relation to his decision to remove WJEC qualifications from September 2022? Um, in terms of WJEC, there was a range of activity that um, took, uh, took place. Um, the first part was obviously the decision in Wales, I believe in November of last year, um, uh, the department asked SIA specifically for how um, WJC examinations might proceed. At that time, we sought clarity from WJC of whether they could offer an exam-based solution um, and some clarity on what the alternative solution was. And we were able to present that information um, about where WJC sat to, to the minister um, and to the department for consideration. In terms of the current decision, um, we received a circular and um, that, that remains the, the, the decision of the, the minister and the department, but certainly we highlighted that there needed to be um, extended time uh, to allow schools to adjust. We've also provided information um, to the department about the range of qualifications that might be considered as alternatives to the WJC, but also flag, and, and I think Minister flagged this this morning, um, that EDUCAS, which is part of WJC, offers the similar specifications albeit off-call um, accredited, um, and those should be available uh, in Northern Ireland. Do you think it was an error to not consult with schools and learners um, who currently access those qualifications? I, I can't comment on that, Chris, because certainly it was a, a decision taken at, at, at a point in time. I think that from our experience, any change in qualification uh, availability needs to be done in a, in a manner that allows time for senders to adjust. Uh, and I think that um, from our perspective, we, we felt that the, the time element was, was important if this decision was going to be taken. Okay. And any conflict of interest in you advising on the use of another awarding body, given you are an awarding body? No, our advice is, you know, at the end of the day, um, examinations um, have policy decisions um, attached to them. We are not like um, Ofqual in that we are an executive body, we're an arm's length body of the Department of Education, whereas Ofqual is a non-executive body um, on okay. that basis. And from our perspective, um, we provided factual information about WJC. We asked WJC about what they could do. We provided that information. Uh, we provided alternatives from the range of the market, not just SEER. So we outlined OCR, AQA, Pearson, and even non-general qualifications as potential alternatives, so um, I don't see any conflict when we're revising okay. without any, a healthy market. Okay, without any consultation with the schools as to what their preference was for those qualifications, and despite having said that an open market is the preference, can I ask you finally if you think that the regulatory function of SEA should be independent? Um, as I said before, SEA is an executive body, so ultimately um, decisions lie in regards to examinations policy at the behest of the minister. We um, decided that not enough. That, that, that is not the same situation as uh, an independent body, such as in Wales with Qualifications Wales or Ofqual. Second to that, SQA in Scotland does operate the regulatory function of inside the Scottish um, position, similar to Northern Ireland, and doesn't have any issues of this nature. Okay, thanks. Clark, can I check that despite uh, losing broadcasting, we are um, uh, permitted to continue? Um, yes, Chair, if members uh, agree to continue to ask questions in closed session and um, to uh, follow up as usual, they, they should make the agreement now. You know, okay, okay, so, so members, yeah, just to get agreement that due to the loss of broadcasting that we have to go into closed session um, and we are still permitted to agree actions for follow up at the end of that, which will of course be on public record then. Agreed? Members indicate agreement. Yep. Agreed. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Sure. Yes. Yeah, this, this, this is a joke, Chair. Sure. This is a joke. Where are we at? This is the 21st century. We're, we're 10 months into a global pandemic. We haven't got access to broadcasting beyond 12 o'clock. What's going on? It's certainly a question that we can ask. Um, Justin, um, I don't have access to people to answer those questions for me right now, so we will, of course, follow that up. I to ask, and people want to see those questions are asked. I think it's unacceptable that I'm not getting my questions asked, and people aren't seeing that important questions being asked. So, 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 yeah. 
here today and I strongly object to this situation. Okay. Anyone else wish to comment and agree that we can continue to ask questions while we have say here, albeit in closed session? I, I, I agree with um, I agree with Justin McNulty's uh, point. It's it is going to be down to a broadband and licensing issue, but Justin, it's a good point well made. I make sure that, that is taken into uh, the commission and the business committee because there are issues with uh, th this is a good platform, but it has limitations too. But you're absolutely right to, to raise it, Justin. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else want to come in and um, agree whether we go into closed session in order to be able to continue to ask questions? I'm happy to go into closed session and ask a few questions, okay. Chris. Thanks for that, Nicola. Thank you. Okay, members, we'll move into closed session and we'll follow up on those uh, serious concerns that have been raised. Can I bring in Robbie? Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29.